بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته peace upon all of you everywhere uh, really it's my honor and happiness today to conduct this meeting on the grand round of mine uh, uh, um, we are using to uh, conduct the meetings about the hot topics in the field of cataract cornea and refractive surgeries and I'm honored today to conduct this meeting about a common problem in all our practices in the cataract surgery. And really, I'm glad to be today with the, the greatest speakers, surgeons, and teachers about this, uh, this, uh, this complication and this field. And uh, let me to introduce um, my guest speakers, Dr. Steve Archinoff. Uh, from Toronto, Canada, is Professor of Ophthalmology, Toronto University, Canada, a correct cornea and refractive surgeon. He uh, put a lot of ads and formally that helped all the correct surgeon to get safer surgery with better outcomes, especially the Archinoff soft chill technique, Archinoff module to deal with the floppy uh, uh, iris syndrome. And he is also the president of the International Society of Sequential or Immediate Bilateral Correct Surgeon. And he is also a brilliant teacher and surgeon and very good human being and good friend. So uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Steve, you. for your participation in your time. And also let me to uh, um, introduce my dear friend and um, my, the, the, the best teacher in the, in the field of the scientific activities uh, and vitro-retinal surgeries as well. Dr. Lalit Verma, vitro-retinal consultant, Apollo Hospital, and uh, he is a vitro-retinal uh, consultant too in the Center of Foresight New Delhi, India. He is a former chairman of scientific committee of the All India Ophthalmological Society. Actually, uh, he, he talked the scientific level of the All India Ophthalmological Society from a place to another fantastic one by improving the quality and the excellence and the capacity of the all conducted scientific activities in the all and different fields of ophthalmology. Also, he's a very good and kind human being and a very good friend and trustable one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lalit. You are muted now. And let me to introduce to my dear brother, Dr. Cameron Reyes from Oklahoma, United States. He is a citizen professor of ophthalmology, McLean Institute of Ophthalmology, Oklahoma University, USA, cornea, uh, cataract and refractive surgeon, fantastic teacher and master conducting all the knowledge and care for his residents and followers and to all of us as well. Uh, uh, Cameron Reyes invented the, the, the amazing forceps. It's called Rabia or Raba forceps, uh, uh, yes, which, which, is, uh, which stands for his um, blessed daughter. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this, this forceps is very helpful and amazing an instrument in the, in the field of endothelial keratoplasty. Is very close, brother, and full of positive power. Thank you, Cameron. I'm glad to see all of you today. Also, let me also let me to introduce my dear friends and my dear residents, Dr. Amr Radi and Dr. Muhammad Abdul Basit, uh, who are re the residents of ophthalmology Al Azhar University, and they are very br brilliant residents and very good surgeons too, and they. They are today the common moderators, the, the, my, my hands, right and left hands, I hope so today. Uh, so let's start the uh, presentations today with my quick presentation about TAS. Uh, and because of the, the topic today is about the, uh, um, the post cataract surgery inflammation, including the sterile and the infective inflammations. So I will cover quickly the sterile inflammation, which is called the toxic anterior segment syndrome. And after a day, 
you, you are spending your surgical day in you know, the OR, and you may feel that you uh, did a, a very good job. Uh, but let, let me to say that the, the successful surgeries w won't be successful or completely successful until you, you have seen, until you get the, the, the first visits with a, a silent, a quiet eyes. Like a pilot, the pilot cannot say that his aircraft has arrived safely until the engine is stopped and its uh, doors uh, are open. So we are the same. We can do a very good surgery with no any complication, but actually we, we cannot say that we are completely happy about that until you, you see our patients safe and happy too. Okay, my screen is good now. Uh, the, the, these photos are with good memories. The first photo up on the left, on, on my left side, is for a patient. With, with, uh, she, she, this patient was 105 years old, and uh, uh, thanking uh, Allah, I, I have done a very good, uh, easy, and successful phaco surgery for her. Uh, and the, the the second photo down is for a patient in my university. Uh, this patient was the first patient who I. Uh, I have done the phaco emulsification surgery in this patient under topical anesthesia, and I discharged this patient without eye patch, following the instructions and, and the, the ads and the pushes of Dr. Steve. As so, uh, if you see your patient in the first morning or in the second morning after surgery with this clear cornea, crystal cornea, and, and the happily and dancing air bubble in the anterior chamber, you will be happy and will be assured about your patient. But if the scenarios um, uh, be different in, in such a situation, you will find this, this uh, depressing picture of that patient. You will see the cornea edematous and the anterior chamber is not clear. But in such a situation, you cannot decide if this patient with corneal edema is traumatic or secondary coronary edema to the thermal effect of the phaco emulsification or to the, an intraocular infection or inflammation. But you have to suspect up till proved otherwise. Uh, when, we, when I want to define the task, I will say that it's an acute severe intraocular inflammation accompanied with a diffuse coronary edema within one to two, day, one to two days of the anterior segment surgery, which is most commonly associated with the cataract surgery. It's also called as strial non infectious endothomites. With a variable pain, with or without pain, markedly decreased the visual acuity, diffuse coronal edema, which extends from limbus to limbus with photophobia and severe anterior, anterior chamber reaction, and occasionally with hypopion. It presents within 12 to 24 hours and it's responsive to topical steroids in most cases. <clears throat> about the etiology, it's multifactorial, maybe with a very common and, and minor factors like the plepharides and the temporal incision with in, an inadequately um, tight or co-opted wound. So it, the, 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 uh, the specious secretions from the um, specious uh, plepharides or the, uh, the, 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 flu the bacterial flora or the other particles which may present the ocular surface may enter the eye through the inadequately uh, tight and co-opted bone and cause this a subclinical infection which may be mistaken as an postoperative evites or test. Uh, the etiology uh, of the test may be retained particles from the lens, either lens fragments, very minute or small lens fragments which may be hidden in the anterior chamber in the angle or under the iris and, and it didn't discovered uh, uh, and it was not discovered by the surgeon. Uh, so we, we have to wash the anterior segment uh, carefully and thoroughly at the end of the operation. Bacterial endotoxins or contaminated intraocular irrig irrigating solutions like the BSS and Ringer solution 
with abnormal pH, which is, which is larger, which is more or less than the accepted one with abnormal osmolarity or ionic composition. Also, the denatured OVD, the viscoelastic materials. The intracameral, the intraocular, actually, the intracameral medications like the antibiotics, which will be covered today by Dr. Steve and Dr. Cameron, inadequate sterilization of the surgical instruments or the uh, or the, uh, uh, the, the improper dealing with the sterilized instruments by drying and washing after getting them out from the autoclaves. Also the preservatives like the benzalkonium, which is reported to cause anterior segment uh, inflammation after using of a substance uh, with benzalkonium as a preservative. Many cases has been reported by different surgeons about that. Also, the topical, the topical anti, uh, the topical eye intervents, which I used to to, to put uh, between the eyelids uh, after at the end of, of my surgery, but actually I don't prefer to put the topical eye intervent if, if there is a, a swollen wound, less coapted wound, or in the extra capsular with wide lips. Also, the metallic precipitates. Clinical picture, it's not uh, usual, it's not usually classic, uh, and, and they are very variable and different in, 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 uh, in different situations. Uh, symptoms, the first symptom is no improvement of vision within 12 to 4, 48 hours. I'm talking about the patient who may be discharged with, without eye patch or to remove the eye patch after a few hours from surgery. Uh, and I recommend that because I don't like to put the, the eye patch on the patient's eye for a long time, uh, except you can, you, 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 you will plan for this patient to see him at the, at the first morning within six or eight or up to 10 hours from the surgery to remove the patch if you are following uh, that, uh, to check your patient's anterior chamber, cornea, and so. I prefer to, uh, to do that very early. Don't uh, delay the visit of your patient, uh, uh, the first visit postoperatively for uh, many days because you cannot judge, uh, uh, from, you cannot judge the, the, his status or his eye condition from, uh, from his description. Uh, actually, it's not, uh, it's not um, uh, accurate all the time. Uh, with mild to severe pain and photophobia, it's ranging according to the severity of the inflammation cells. Signs will be severe anterior chamber reaction, as shown in the figure on the right side, the coronary edema from limbus to limbus. And this, this point will, will put another cause of the, the post-operative coronal edema. Uh, you, you, will, you will not think more in just a thermal effect or a decompensated cornea. You will, you will put another cause, which is the TAS in, in the list of differential diagnosis of the post-operative coronary edema. When you check the pupil, you will see the pupil dilated or irregular, so uh, you, you, you will suspect that. Uh, also, hypobium may be present, and also the hypobium is not like that in the cases of endothelmites, and you, I will show that, and Dr. Larit will cover that too. If you did a culture, you will find it negative with very good response to the topical steroids. Uh, so the test will be part in differential diagnosis of the post aortic inflammation with the endothelmites and the masquerade syndrome like in lymphoma and the vitreous hemorrhage after that because of the uh, lack of the red reflex. Finally, you, you may get this picture in the early morning, if you find this picture up, you will put the first diagnosis at the TAS or very early in the thermites. But put in your consideration that the TAS may occur very early within 12 to 48 hours from the surgery, but the endothelmites is, is it's more in severity and also it may uh, start later, three to seven days after surgery. But Please be careful in your diagnosis. Results of, of, of tests, it's toxic damage to the intraocular tissues in the form of cell necrosis, apoptosis, extracellular damage, it's histopathological 
description of the test, uh, leading to acute severe inflammation or acute severe inflammatory immune response. It's also uh, leading to corneal endothelial cell destruction uh, or inflammatory damage. And so it's called toxic endothelial cell destruction syndrome, the other name for TAS. The major problem here is that the TAS mimics the endothelmites. Then how to judge? Uh, the the TAS, uh, the timing of TAS is the first day, mostly in the first day or up to the second day, but endothelmites usually the second or beyond. But there is also what's called delayed onset test. The pain is none or mild to moderate unless the visual uh, very high intraocular pressure. Uh, it's the pain is much more in uh, much more in the endothelmites, but uh, uh, actually 25% of patients may start with no pain if the if, uh, if, if the virulence of the organism is less than uh, usual. The discharge is watery, watery discharge, just a lacrimating eye, but in the, the endothelmites, there is period and discharge. About the conjunctiva and late reaction is less intense than the endothelmites. You will find that the inflammation is confined to the cornea and the anterior chamber, but endothelmites, you will find the conjunctiva is, is echematic, is bolus, and the eyelids are swollen again. Corneal edema, limbus to limbus edema, localized or segmental in the endothelmites, so it's more extending in case of this. The anterior chamber, the test, there is a fibrin, it's fibrinous uh, more than perilent, and it may be collected to form occasional hypopion, which is precipitated in the anterior chamber. It's moving, it's not fixed. Uh, end of endothelmite, there is hypopion, should be. Uh, about the, the iris, fixed, dilated, and often spotty or diffuse areas of atrophy. Uh, the, the, in the end of the mice, there is always a muddy iris, and, but in most cases, you will not see the iris. The intraocular pressure, it's normal or, or high in, uh, in, uh, in the case of this. And due to the severe reaction, which increasing the uh, the interacted pressure by the trabeculites or by the secondary obstruction of the trabecular meshwork too, but it will find it low to normal in case of the endothelmites at the early stage. But in the later stage, uh, after the severe uh, the, the extensive diffusion of the perineal discharge and inflammation, the IP will be increased. But after that, it's it's lower and lower, getting the thesis the, the thetic uh, status after uh, the endothelmites. About the vitreous, you will find the vitreous clear or very mild, limited uh, vitreous in the anterior segment, but mostly it's clear in case of test, but in the endothelmites, there is a vitreous, there is a vitreous diffuse vitreous, or there is vitreous hemorrhage, or even there is vitreous abscess. <clears throat> about the treatment of tests, roll out first the endothelmites and then give intense steroid therapy. Prednisolone one percent hourly. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the form of nibifenac or ketorolac. The close follow-up uh, uh, every every day or or to twice per day to roll out the infection and to check the degree of the inflammation and turn on the status of cornea and to check the intraocular pressure, either to continue your treatment or your shift to another diagnosis. Consider the subconjunctive injection of the mix of steroid antibiotic and atropine, which is called the medrakine injection, which is very helpful in such cases. So the prognosis of test may be a very, very good in mild cases with cure in a few days with no damage and the but may, may be prolonged up to three to six weeks in the moderate cases with variable damages to the intraocular tissues. Uh, but the severe is, is not with well-known prognosis may lead to severe damage to the anterior segment with other complication. As you see uh, in the, the images on the right side, the corneal edema may be 
with prolonged after after recovery from the test, there is prolonged corneal opacity with the straight keratopathy as you are seeing, and in the middle there is fibrin membrane uh, in in the pupil, and finally there is fibrin membrane maybe occluding the vision, uh, especially if present at the center, and there are formations of fibrins and and the globule, globes or globules in the anterior chamber with precipitates on the anterior surface of the IL leading to the picture of the IL you are seeing now. So the prevention assembly uh, of TAS may be uh, uh, to be meticulous, to be careful uh, when you use uh, the irrigating solution to know about them, about their sterility, about them about their sterility, about their components. Um, also, please don't use the, the, uh, the previously used one. You have to change the bottle. You have to be care that this bottle is not contaminated from other, by other syringes, by other sources, and so. Please dry, dry the instruments, especially the fecal tip and the, the, the eye, the, the hand piece and the fecal tips before, before wash them by irrigating the solution after getting them out from the autoclave or the cassette, the sterilizing cassettes, before they, they get dry, wash them and uh, clean them perfectly to, to wash out the, the detergents and the, uh, the disinfectant materials used by the water in the cassettes and, and so, because of the enzymes and the precipitates will be a cause for the test. Also, the intracameral drugs should be careful. Don't inject any drug inside the eye with preservatives at all. Also, the uh, prescription of, uh, and the instruction of the patient to follow the post-operative treatments properly after that. And then finally, you can say that uh, you have arrived safely at the end. And thank you very much. Okay. okay, can you hear me well? Yes, Osama. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Steve, I will uh, ask you now, please, to start your presentation about the intracameral antibiotics uh, and how to be uh, away from any reactions inside. Please. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much. Let me just share my screen. Yes. Uh, hopefully, you can see it now. Yeah, okay. Very All right, well. So, I was asked to talk about avoiding post op inflammation and mostly to stress intracameral antibiotics. So, here you see what I prefer. I'm injecting intracameral Vigamox, which I dilute because there have been a number of papers and discussions showing that you get a better quantification of what you put in the eye when you dilute it and don't try to inject exactly uh, 0.1 cc. Um, I want to first thank you for inviting me. These are my disclosures none of which apply to this. And the reason I inject intracameral Vigamox, which I've done for many years, I was the first in the world to do it, and I've done over 9,500 cases, and I haven't in all these cases seen a single patient that got post-op fibrin. And on post-op day one, I see minimal, minimal cells in the anterior chamber, which I think is what we should see. It should look sort of like it looks over here, like when we finished, it should look okay, except the pupil will be smaller. And I'm convinced that most of the post-op inflammation that we see is due to subclinical infections. And it's cleared by an immune system and leaving you with a somewhat inflamed eye the second day. So I want to first uh, thank Hossam and my co-speakers for inviting me to take part in this. Uh, I'm always very happy to uh, be involved with such uh, fantastic speakers and trying to do my bit to, to say something to hopefully to add. It's our honor, really. Yeah. So thank you. So my agenda really is, I'm not going to talk about endothelmitis or TAS because others are. I'll talk about surgical injury and subclinical infections and what we can do to prevent that. I think what we should do is you first prevent things. You should do perfect surgery, and I'm not accusing anybody of not having learned to do surgery right. But to me, perfect surgery means that you should spend a lot of time learning in great detail how your phaco machine works, how your femto machine works, how each OVD works, how sterile they are, how they're prepared. Intracameral antibiotics and how they're prepared. Do they have preservatives? And if so, how much and where do you get them from? 
and all the post-op drugs you use. And every single step in surgery that you do, you should try to arrange to be as atraumatic as possible. Even exactly where you make an incision, exactly where you touch something, try to do as little as you can to achieve what you want. And you should treat every patient as if that patient potentially will get an infection, because if you do, you will have fewer problems. In the treatment I will discuss are intracranial antibiotics, manage uh, severe problems, which the other speakers will talk about, and then topical eye drops that I use. So, uh, the first thing I'll discuss is intracranial moxifloxacin. I was the first in the world to use it, and uh, there's plenty of evidence now about how well intracaramel antibiotics work. In September 2017, we had a large discussion at ESCRS, and at that time, there were over 7 million eyes that had been published in different studies showing that they reduced the infection rate to about one-eighth of what you get when you don't use intracaramel antibiotics. And since then, we've had Harry Priya's article with 2 million more eyes and a number of other studies. And so we're now looking at really studies involving more than 10 million eyes confirming the advantage of these drugs. Two of the studies did not show an advantage, and those two came from Japan. And in both cases, they used too low a dose, only about one-fifth the effective dose to be effective. So if, if you don't give a significant dose, you don't get much result. So in terms of what I've done, I've done so far over 9,500 cases of intracaramel Vigamox using this sort of regime. It works fine. It's a dose-dependent drug, and in the dose we use, it kills everything that you get in the eye. And if you do it right, you should not get infections unless you have wound leaks. So let's talk about the drugs. There were initially five drugs that were candidates for intracaramel use that are listed. I've sort of uh, diminished the intensity of two of them because they're in the same class as another drug, which was proven to be more effective. So if we look at these three drugs, you want to compare them, vancomycin, cefuroxime, and moxifloxacin, which are fill, fit into different classes. These two drugs, vanco and cefuroxime, are given in the same concentration. And interestingly enough, the MIC90s of the target bacteria are the same. Whereas moxifloxacin is very different. It works differently than the other two. It doesn't impair cell wall synthesis. It works on DNA. And so it's advantageous also because it goes through a very different mechanism of being an antibiotic than the other drugs do. Each of these drugs has risks and concerns. <clears throat> vancomycin we'll talk about first. You may know that uh, vancomycin got its name when it was invented in 1956 because the inventors believed that they could vanquish all infections with this drug. It turns out that it was reserved early on for resistant uh, infections and to be used as an agent of last resort. Its dilution is complex. We had a problem with it in Canada because our government demanded that we use generics that were made in Toronto and cost less than one-tenth of what Lily's uh, vancomycin cost. And that one, it was known to cause tasks. The company told us it causes tasks because the tests in rabbits showed that it did. So we really couldn't use it. And even when we could get Lily's, which was rare, uh, that was okay, but problematic to obtain. And then in 2015, the whole issue of Horv uh, began to appear, and I think since then, most everyone has taken this drug and put it back as an agent of last resort and not use it for prophylaxis. Cefuroxime was proposed by the ESCRS, which is basically a copy of a Swedish study. And the problem with this drug is that it works by the same mechanism as the drugs that we use to treat endophthalmitis. So any bacteria resistant to this will usually give you an untreatable endophthalmitis. And that's what enterococci do. And so we get infections when we use cefuroxime that are usually not very well treatable, and these patients tend to go blind. It's also complicated to dilute. Now you can get it pre-diluted. But in the beginning, we had all kinds of issues of fusarium contamination and other in problems and not adequately diluted and causing TAS and various corneal problems and things. And also, uh, being related to penicillins, you can get allergy and anaphylaxis. Moxifloxacin has had the least number of troubles. There isn't a single publication of any toxicity or damage from this drug. Uh, people claim that we get increasing resistance. Well, you do if you give it systemically, but the amount we use in the eye is much, much higher concentration, and it's a dose-dependent drug. And there hasn't yet been a single bacteria strain that is resistant to the dose we put in the eye intracamerally. There was one case of anaphylaxis to topical moxifloxacin, but I mean, in the millions of doses used, one case is not surprising. 
There were issues with other drugs in the same categories, but nothing of any real significance. So of all, it's probably the safest drug. We decided a number of years ago to try to look at these, and we were unhappy with the fact that in every one of these studies, we would get a, a sample taken from the eye, either at surgery or a day or two post-op, but we never got a good idea of whether the abatement rates of these drugs were in the eye and how effective they were. So we thought we'd create a mathematical model, and this was our first of a series of papers. And we looked at moxifloxacin first. And the first thing we did was we plotted the resistance of the usual target bacterial strains, the uh, mutant prevention concentration of this strain. So we know that if we're above this level, it doesn't really get mutants or resistance whatsoever. And then we also plotted the level of the two most resistant bacterial strains ever found in the world, uh, which are quite rare, but nevertheless could occur. And you can see in the way that moxifloxacin declines in this line in the eye over a number of hours, that you have really seven or eight hours where the drug will be effective against even the most resistant strain you might get from anywhere, which is quite good and better than every other drug, because that means that this, in this area, it kills everything that might be in the eye. There is no other drug that kills everything. The duration of action is probably about 37 to 38 hours above the uh, MIC-90 of the most common target bacteria. And the drug we used here was a 600 micrograms in 0.4 mils that I proposed as the best way to give it. So we then a couple of years later published a second paper. And in this paper, we did the same mathematical calculation for the two other common drugs. And we published that and made one graph to put all the data together. And here you see the moxifloxacin line in blue against the same background of the resistance strains. And then you see the red one. I told you before that vancomycin and cefuroxime are injected in the same dose, and the MICs are the same. So you can have one line really showing both bacteria in red. And then we shifted these graphs because of the dose-dependent post-antibiotic effect of fluoroquinolones and the time dependence of the other two drugs. And so it makes you shift the graph a little bit mathematically. And what you see is the gap between the level of moxifloxacin in the eye and the target of the bacteria is about twice as high as the gap between either vanco or cefuroxime and the target of the bacteria. And this translates, when you look at the curves, that the effective time that the drug will be useful is about twice as long here for moxifloxacin as it is for the other two agents. So this again shows you it's probably a better drug. Okay. Then we want to look and see, well, most people in the world use either topical eye drops post-op or pre-op, and, and some use oral antibiotics. And we want to just figure out if we can take those models and then look at these topical applications and see if it makes any difference. So that's what we were just, this is in press now. We've been working on that for a couple of years. And here's what you see. If we take the decline of moxifloxacin, which I showed you on the first graph of the first paper, and then we add in the maximum number of drops you would ever give anybody every hour, you see that what happens is make no difference at all for the first 12 hours. And then you see you get a subtle difference and it levels out if you keep giving the patient a drop every hour to about four times the mutant prevention concentration of the target bacteria, but you never get a high enough level of these drops by themselves to kill the most resistant strains. If you give only topical drops and you don't give it with the intracaramel drug, then it takes about four or five hours to get up to four times the prevention concentration, and then stays there for as long as you keep giving topical drops. So what this would do is if you say above this MPC, that means for as long as you give topical drops, the patient is protected against the most common bacteria. So for example, if the patient has a wound leak, that would protect them for as long as you keep giving the drops. It won't protect them against the most resistant strains, but it will protect them against the most common strains. So then we thought we'll take this and look at what happens if you give drops. So if you give drops six times a day, you get enough of dose in the eye to stay just above the mutant prevention concentration of the target bacteria, and four times a day, it sort of zigzags around the MVC. So that's okay. And now we look at the graphs all together, and so you see that we really don't need to get her every hour. If we give it six times a day, we will stay above the mutant prevention concentration of the more common target bacteria, but none of these would ever get you high enough to kill the most resistant strains, and for that, you're going to need to give it intracamerally. So the topical drops are really helpful in case of a wound leak. What happens if you try to give them systemically, because some places in the world give them one dose orally, 
12 hours pre-op and a second dose of surgery. Well, what this graph starts at surgery. So if you go back over here, the level was about up here and it declines towards surgery and then goes up again so that you get a dose that is higher than the MPC at surgery and for one day post-op. So if the patient was, let's say, septic or in a car accident and may be infected, this would protect you from getting an endogenous spread of an infection into the eye when you're doing surgery. But it is not nearly high enough to do anything that might occur uh, in the eye. And you can see when you add it to the intracameral dose, it has no effect at all until you're about 24 hours out. And then because of the reservoir in the body, the decline from giving oral antibiotic is slower than a decline if you only give intracameral. So its major effect would be giving it to a patient who might have an infection elsewhere. So the next question is, well, are these models right? Well, the only way you can tell if a mathematical model is right is if you look at the other information we have in the world and see if it matches the model, because we can't keep going and sticking patients in the eye every hour post-op. So Libra and Matthews published a study in 2017 looking at 18 endophthalmitis uh, isolates from Bascom Palmer and what they were sensitive to. And they showed that only oral moxifloxacin, only moxifloxacin was effective against all the isolates. Vanco and cefuroxime were not effective against pseudomonas. And the commonly used drugs, even at low doses, all of them will kill streptococci. But the elimination of the resistant staph and pseudomonas require the maximum doses of moxifloxacin, 0.5 milligrams or more, which means what I told you in the beginning about those two cases from Japan, that's why those studies didn't show an efficacy because they were giving too low a dose. So you should use moxifloxacin, it's the most effective drug, but you have to use a high enough dose. Next, a meta-analysis was done a year later, looking at all the papers published on intracameral antibiotics, and it was published in the BJO. And this showed that if you look at all the data put it together, it turns out that the least effective of our three drugs is cefuroxib. These two, moxifloxacin and vancomycin, had no significant difference, but both had a significantly lower infection rate than with cefuroxib. And if you look at the data, in every case, it was enterococci that were causing the infections, uh, where you didn't get them with the other drugs. So how do you make moxifloxin to give it dilutely? It's really simple. You take the bottle, and here I put fluorescein in, so it's a brighter yellow than the moxifloxacin, just for the picture. And you take the three millimeters of Vigamox, and you add to it seven millimeters of BSS. You put in a syringe, you roll the syringe, and then the circulator nurse goes to the scrub nurse's tray and puts about half a cc of this onto every tray for the scrub nurse to aspirate and hand to the surgeon in a TB syringe. And that gives you enough to do about 16 eyes. It's totally sterile because the syringe is kept in another room. And the surgeon injects 0.4 mils into the anterior chamber, basically exchanging the volume of the uh, pseudophagic anterior chamber. You can use the Sandoz authorized generic. That's the only one that has been definitely proven to be safe. And I know that this lecture is going to other countries which have other antibiotics. So I know that in India, they use different ones. I'm, I'm sure in Africa, they do as well. As long as you're sure that the uh, generic that you're getting is safe, it's probably okay. But in North America, I suggest people only use Vigamox or Sandoz. The other ones have not been shown in North America to be safe. So. How about other post-operative topical eye drops? In the last year or two, we've seen these articles from the es pre premed study talking about giving non-steroidals and subconjunctival steroids. And what they showed is that macular edema is considerably less common if you give topical NSAIDs postoperatively. And then, for example, in diabetics, if you give a subconjunctival injection of steroid, that you get less macular edema in the diabetics, or at least the, the macula is not as thick and so it probably is healthier. So these are the three drops you want to give postoperatively, and let's talk about how I give those. Because there are a number of issues when you're doing surgery, not just the drug you want to use. First thing is, I don't want to patch people's eyes. I do nine-tenths of my cases as bilateral cataract surgery, and you can't do bilateral surgery and send the patient out with two patches on their eyes. So since probably 1990, I've not used any patches, and for sure since doing routine bilateral surgery starting in 1996. And the regimen I use is I give them moxifloxacin, a three mil bottle, prednisone and acetate, five mils, and cutorolac, 10 mils. I also give them a drop of pilocarpine 
I had surgery when I finished the case. Uh, and then I give them the little minims they come in and you can get in Canada to take home with them and put a second drop in six or eight hours later if the patient has glaucoma to prevent any post-op pressure spike. But these drops, I tell them to take one of each drop six times a day for the first four days and to begin taking them one hour post-op. The reason for that is I want to totally stop any inflammation before it starts. You're probably all aware that the best time to prevent inflammation is to give the stuff immediately. If you prevent the eye from beginning to get down the inflammatory cascade, you do much better than trying to abort it once it started. And then after the first four days, I tell the patient, take the drops four times a day until the bottles are empty. I give them one of each bottle for each eye if I do bilateral surgery. I give them two sets of bottles and I have them wrapped for right and left eyes so they don't confuse them. The Vigamox given this way will last eight or eight days or so. The Predfort will last two weeks and the Ketorolac will last four weeks. The reasons for this, well, frequent drops early do more than just treat the patient. They tell the patient that cataract surgery is not trivial. When you start doing bilateral surgery and the patients can see right away, they go play golf an hour later, they go move their furniture, they do all kinds of things we might consider to be not very cautious because they think that you've done a trivial procedure to them. If you tell them they must begin their drops an hour later and take them six times a day, including six times a day of surgery, they think, oh boy, this is really serious. I better be careful for the first three or four days. And I want my patients to be careful. So I give them intracameral moxifloxacin because it has been proven to drastically reduce the incidence of post-op endopsomitis. I give them Vigamox six times a day and then four times after the first four days because it's a high enough dose to kill all but the most resistant strains in case the patient rubs their eye or gets a wound leak for whatever reason. Sorry. Um, I give them Predfort, Fizzlone Acetate, five mils, the same dose, because it rapidly aborts any inflammatory response. I want my eyes to look like it did at the end of surgery, totally uninflamed the next day. And I give them Ketorolac, 10 mils, because it's been shown by the pre-med study and in my own experience for 25 years, that if you give this, the patients don't get CME. And I, I think I've not had anybody except for one patient with retinitis pigmentosa and whom you expect CME that got CME that was significant uh, post-op. And I do uh, OCTs on them all when they come back at two or three weeks and they're, they look fine. Um, so conclusions. Post-op inflammation is minimized by knowing every step of your technique meticulously and then even better than meticulously. Be totally obsessive and extremely neat with your surgery. Make sure that every single step is atraumatic and go to a lot of trouble to learn how to position your hands, how to hold things, how to make your surgery atraumatic. Use intracameral antibiotics. I think moxifloxacin is the best and I think now it's by far the most common in the world. And I think it's best if you dilute it. I th I'm quite convinced that post-op fibrin or severe inflammation in the case of not having endophthalmitis is still due to a subclinical infection which the patient's immunity fights off. And use topical drops six times a day for the first four days to make the patient think this is a serious thing they're doing and then four times a day until the bottles are all finished. And by doing that, I can tell you, and I'm not trying to think I'm better than anybody else, but I get extremely little inflammation, and most of my patients see 2025 or so on post-op day one when I check them. Their eyes are crystal clear, and there's no issues. And I've evolved this over many years, and it works. So I suggest you try it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steve Archinoff, about this for this wonderful presentation and the, the, the well covering uh, uh, every every point about the intracameral drugs and the post-operative treatment. But let me to ask you another question to clarify a point. Uh, you you just adding you you just add the the pilocarpine in the patients with risk of glaucoma or on. on I give on everybody pilocarpine because I want them to see right away, and when they have dilated pupils and I don't patch them, they complain of glare and all kinds of stuff. So I realized if I give them pilocarpine, by the time I do the second eye, the first eye's pupil is small. Yeah, yeah, okay. And they sit up and they can see. Yeah, this is because the, there's no patch. Uh, there's no patch. And I yeah, want them to 
Yeah, you're, or else they're going to call you later and complain. You're, so you're this able, way, yeah. they sit outside you. with the nurse for half an hour. By the time they get up to go home, they're seeing like 20, 30 or something, and it's fine. Okay. Uh, but, but you are still in, uh, uh, saying that the intracameral drugs will be injected and add to the topical drugs. You, you cannot both inject them instead of the, the topical treatment postoperatively. Well, it, it there are cannot. a number of concerns. First, I don't give any topical drops pre-op. There have been a number of studies of which I didn't have time to go through them that show that when you give preoperative antibiotics especially, you actually increase the patient's risk of infection because you're killing off all the sensitive bacteria and you're allowing a fertile conjunctiva for the occasional resistant strain in the environment to grow in that patient's eye. So yeah. you actually increase your risk of infection. So I don't do that at all. Yeah. They don't get any drops till they walk into the OR or to the waiting room. And then yeah. they're given the drops three times before they come into surgery. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a, it's a very good point about the uh, yeah. preoperative antibiotic uh, uh, drops before surgery. But uh, I'm asking again. Uh, uh, yeah, post-op. My, my, yeah, my, my point okay, is post-op. I give them post-op for two reasons. One of them, it tells the patient that having surgery is serious. And by them having to do something, they don't go and play golf or do something stupid in the first hour or two or the first day or so after surgery. And secondly, in the off chance that a patient has a wound leak, the drug is in enough concentration to prevent them from getting infected with by far the most common bacteria. Yeah. So it, it adds, it's like a belt and suspenders. It's one more safety thing you do. And I, I don't think that I ever want to give patients transondular injections. There have been a number of uh, articles that showed some concern with that and also it makes it blurry because it's not clear and it can get in front of the visual axis and I think they don't gain anything from doing that they're just better off with topical drops that prevents the occasional issue with the wound leak the patients are more careful and I want them to be careful for a couple of days yeah okay very nice but about, well, I have a lot of questions about your topic okay. but I, I, I let, let me uh, it, um, postponing the question after the uh, other presentation to not, not, not to uh, mm. loss not to not to uh, waste the, the, the times Be to collect the old questions together and discuss it all together at the end um, especially after showing the other opinions by dr. Cameron Reyes and Dr. dr. Larry Verma at the end uh, also for the the, the audience uh, I, uh, because of the matter of security I uh, Excuse me, I prevented the, the, the chatting, but if, you, if, you, uh, if anyone wa wants to ask, he can raise the hand or send me to the Ziada I Academy page, Facebook page, Ziada I Academy. I will collect the questions and uh, uh, my, my dear uh, guest speakers will ad address all of them. Uh, so um, I, I may ask my, my dear brother and um, uh, my dear uh, colleague, Dr. Cameron Reyes, to give us uh, his uh, wonderful presentation about the uh, the dropless cataract surgery. Dropless cataract surgery. This is this was my question to Dr. Steve to get dropless cataract surgery. Please, Dr. Cameron. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, and uh, for for having me. And it's it's an honor to join the distinguished. Uh, panel, especially Dr. Arshinov, who I'm greatly admired uh, from my time as a resident, and I told him in the chat that the Arshinov uh, soft shell technique has saved my skin many a time in the operating room. So, uh, truly a pleasure to to join this uh, distinguished panel, and I hope to just kind of ride the coattails of the uh, other speakers here. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, Let's see here. Let's go and share that. Can, can everybody see that? Uh, not yet. Yes, no, no, I can see it. Okay, great. Let's uh, start the presentation. Let me go into presentation yeah. mode. Ben, yeah, binge it the full screen. Can everybody see that now? Yeah, but it's okay. somewhat, somewhat haze. Yeah, okay. Start, you can start now and I will check with it. Okay, great. So um, uh, I'm gonna kind of build a, a little bit about some of the previous topics that were talked about and, and uh, speak about how we can move towards uh, dropless cataract surgery. And we're gonna talk about my experiences with uh, intravitreal 
trimcinolone, moxifloxacin, and also vancomycin injection after uh, cataract surgery. Um, let's see here, let's go to the next slide. So I do not have any financial interests. I do have some unrelated disclosures that are not uh, related to this particular topic. So I want to talk about a couple of things here. So first of all, the, the rationale behind intravitreal antibiotic and steroid injection after excuse cataract me, surgery. Camera, camera, excuse yes. me. Because yes. what about the other, uh, uh, the other, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, there is, there is something about the resolution of the screen. What about uh, your screen, Steve? Do, do you see it clearly? It's totally, it's totally blurry. Yeah, it's totally blurry. You can re, re, uh, stop sharing and reconnect again. Okay. Yeah, I can read the, 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 the top title very hardly, the biggest one. So re, reshare your screen again. Let me try that again. How is that now? Yeah, much it's, better. Yeah, much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it was a it was a bad connection early on or something like that. Let me go to full screen here. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Start the full screen again. Okay. Is this is this better? Yeah. Much yes. better. Yeah, yes. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um. So so my, so my objectives today are talk about the following things here. So first of all, what is the rationale behind doing an injection uh, into the vitreous of antibiotic and steroid after cataract surgery? Uh, we'll talk about some of the advantages as well as some of the shortcomings of this technique. Um, uh, we'll talk about some of the experiences we've had over the past four years, and then identifying some of the future directions, which is mainly the patient populations as well as associated risk factors in whom in the injection may be um, sufficient and which patients may need additional topical therapy. And finally, to uh, propose an algorithm for when topical anti-inflammatory medication supplementation uh, would be helpful with IVAS after cataract surgery. So, um, well, why inject um, into the vitreous as compared to intracameral or transonular? Well, we all have two goals after cataract surgery. The first is to prevent infection. We know that the final destination for bacteria is the vitreous because it is a nutrient-rich environment without a blood supply. It's basically a petri dish that is there in the two-thirds of the eye. Uh, the limitation of the intracameral antibiotics, as Dr. Arshinov uh, very brilliantly shared, is that the drug is washed out of the eye in a fairly short amount of time. And we know that, uh, for example, in rabbit studies, that Moxie uh, only stays at therapeutic concentration for about eight hours, whereas for this group of drugs, um, we need at least 10 times the MIC for optimal bactericidal effect. Vancomycin is advantageous because it is a time-dependent antibiotic. In other words, it needs to stay in the eye for a certain amount of time, whereas moxifloxacin is a concentration-dependent um, antibiotic. And so, and, I, and I'll talk about the limitations of VANC in, in just a bit, but so really what we're doing here is that we're prophylactically placing antibiotic and steroid into the vitreous, which is where I believe is really where all of the, the, the unfortunate fun and games happen that leads to things like endophthalmitis more than the anterior uh, chamber. Our second goal is really to control inflammation. Um, traditionally, this has been controlled with topical steroidal or non-steroidal medications. Uh, you know, technically, at least in the United States, uh, these are off-label use of these medications. Uh, topical steroids are approved for a treatment of uh, intraocular inflammation, but nowhere on the bottle does it ever say that it's used for post-operative inflammation. Of course, uh, it's standard of practice and customary care that we use it, but it's interesting that this is not the indication uh, for this medication. Similarly, um, at least in the United States, the indication for all commercially available topical antibiotics is for the treatment of bacterial conjunctivitis. Nowhere on the bottle does it ever say that it can be used for the treatment of prevention of post-operative uh, infection. Again, nonetheless, we all uh, use it as part of our practice, but it is something that we should question um, that, uh, that this is the indication of the medication versus what we actually use it for. Uh, the end result of uh, uncontrolled pseudophagic anterior chamber inflammation we know is cystoid macular edema, which is often treated with subtenon or intravitreal steroid injections. And with this approach, um, we know that trimcinolone is very potent and is often used by those who treat CME or retina colleagues uh, to actually treat the uh, uh, cystoid macular edema. We know that trimcinolone is very potent, has a significant duration effect. And so with IVAS, intravitreal antibiotic and steroid injection, we again are prophylactically placing antibiotic and steroid into the vitreous cavity, which I would argue is where uh, all of this unfortunate fun and games happen. So what is our experience? 
uh, I, I was interested uh, shortly after training in the summer of 2014 uh, with the transonular approach, which, would, which had been advocated by Imprimis. Uh, again, I do not have any financial interest with the company. And I've only used uh, this, this medication, whether it's Trimoxyvanc or Trimoxy formulated by Imprimis, which at least in the United States has a 503B uh, designation, which means that they're subjected to governmental um, uh, regulation and inspection, similarly to other, other pharmacies like Alcon and Allergan and all of the other big names. However, I found that the transonular approach, at least in my hands, perhaps I'm, I'm not a good surgeon, uh, just wasn't very effective and I was have, I find it to be very awkward. And as having uh, gone through residency in, in the era of intravitreal injections, I found why not just go ahead and inject it into the vitreous cavity, which is where we want this medication to be. And since then, we've been able to compare our cases both in a university setting, which we have not been allowed to use the intravitreal injection there, as well as in an ASC where we are able to use the intravitreal injection. So we've been able to actually have a control group that has been getting the routine topical uh, drops. We do not inject intracamerally, as Dr. Uh, Arshinov described, but uh, there we've only been able to use topical drops. Uh, but uh, in the uh, patients at the ambulatory surgical center, we are able to inject. And so we've been able to gather uh, approximately, this, this probably needs to be updated to almost now 2,500 patients with drops and droplets both as a comparison during this time. So let's describe the technique here. So at the conclusion of the case, uh, 0.124 seps is used to graft the superior limbus. Caliper set at 3.5 millimeters to measure posteriorly from the infrotemporal limbus. This would give them a, a floater uh, superiorly. Uh, so it still allows them to read and um, but uh, this, uh, you know, helps to kind of minimize some of the uh, visual effects that this has. Uh, 0.15 ml of tri uh, trimoxy uh, vanc, and, and this was done uh, in our practice until about April 2017, until the concerns of HORV, which I'll talk in a bit here. Uh, or trimoxy vanc is injected through the pars plana into the vitreous via a 1 cc syringe and a 30 gauge needle. This is the concentration of what we are actually injecting. As we can see here that our injection is actually gonna be a higher concentration than the 600 micrograms that was described and discussed by uh, Dr. Arshinov. The wounds are checked a final time to ensure watertight closure. And I'll show you a very quick video here that just kind of shows that it doesn't really take a lot of time to do this. I've talked to folks here that feel that this takes a lot of time to do and uh, you know this really takes about a minute uh, at the end of the case here. So here we're just showing measuring the 3.5 millimeters. I don't try to eyeball this. It is very important, I think, to to uh, to mark it here. So grasping this limbus there, uh, making a, a small mark, and we just try to get a small indentation mark here at the end of the case. The nurse will usually drop about 0.2 cc's. I'll push out about 0.5 to get uh, uh, get rid of any air bubbles. And there we're just going to inject. Uh, we will see kind of a very scary, somewhat of a, a plume uh, there in the back. And sometimes the patient will move a little bit. I purposely chose this case to show that the uh, patient may move. We will give additional topical um, you know, uh, uh, anesthetic drops. Um, and then we'll check the eye here, just using digital palpation to make sure that uh, everything is physiological uh, intraocular pressure, and then checking the wound with a wet cell and the, and the case is concluded. So it really doesn't take a whole lot of additional time here. Um, let's see if we can advance to the next slide. Uh, let's pause that. Let's just go to the next slide. There we go. So why should we do this? Well, uh, I'd like to call it, uh, discuss the advantages as what I like to call the five C's here. So we'll talk about five things that start with the letter C as to why we should go ahead and do this craziness here. So Number one, uh, decreased cost to the patients. Uh, in the United States, this is the cost that most patients pay uh, for the, getting the three different eye drops of the antibiotic, steroid, and non-steroidal. And I know in places like Canada, Egypt, India, this is probably much cheaper, but in the good old uh, US of A, this is how much many patients are, pay, are paying. Uh, whereas dropless therapy is about 20 to $25 per vial, so about $22. And usually in one vial, we can get at least two injections. So really costs about $11 uh, per eye. This is the estimated uh, cost of savings, uh, $1.4 billion for out-of-pocket uh, co-payment costs. Another uh, indirect cost, which we can term as convenience here, at least in the United States, many of our patients are older and they often get family members 
or relatives to stay at home with them to help them with their drops. I've had patients tell me that they have their uh, pastor or neighbor come by to help them uh, take their drops. So this is indirect costs and convenience that is uh, born, uh, which is difficult to quantify financially, but nevertheless, I think does take up time and money that is spent towards topical therapy. Well, what about patient compliance? We know that compliance is multifactorial. There's a mental component, which is, you know, your patient has to understand the importance of using the drops. And sometimes there may be some supratentorial uh, causes for why patients may not be able to take their drops, but also physical reasons. Many patients are older. They have uh, arthritis or difficulty squeezing the bottles and getting the bottles directly, uh, the drop directly into the eye. And there have been studies that have been shown that really a good number of percentage of patients either have poor drop technique, miss the eye, 81% uh, cannot recall being shown how to instill the drop. So, um, so, so even though we give the patient the drop, unless we actually have someone administer drops or put a video camera on them, uh, compliance remains a, a, a big concern. Let's talk a little bit about collateral ocular surface damage. As a cornea specialist, you know, I, I think that many cataract surgeons don't respect the cornea. Well, we know that topical ophthalmic medications can damage the ocular surface due to multiple mechanisms, especially BAK toxicity. Patients who are predisposed are patients who are uh, dry eye patients, elderly patients, or already have severe ocular disease, uh, uh, autoimmune type of inflammation going on, where these drops can really exacerbate the ocular surface. So even though we've done pristine uh, surgery, many times these patients come in with severe punctate epithelial keratopathies a week or two later, especially from the topical NSAIDs, and, and can really uh, ruin uh, the patient's experience with the uh, uh, surgery. So with IVAS, we're reducing the chance of corneal toxicity uh, due to preservatives that are found in commonly available topical uh, medications. As far as the uh, less calls and conversations, hours can be added to an already busy clinic day. So many of us as surgeons may not appreciate how many times patients are calling our staff secretaries, there's somebody's time that's being paid for uh, to go over patient education, uh, inbox messaging from uh, insurance uh, coverage concerns. Again, may not be so much of a problem in other parts of the world. Here in the United States, the insurance companies are king. And they. Uh, I've had patients where prednisolone was substituted by Preparacane, by an enterprising uh, pharmacist. So so these are uh, you know very concerning uh, situations where you know patients may not get the drops that we're uh, 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 giving them, or uh, the insurance company or the pharmacist may decide to substitute with uh, another topical medication that may think uh, that they may think is equal uh, coverage or uh, effective against what we're trying to do. And of course, the phone calls, the number of phone calls that come in that someone from the, our office ends up having to answer, and that is um, man or woman labor hours that can be used for. Uh, more effective and efficient things here. So uh, this is, uh, you know, what, what can be done. Well, there are also disadvantages. I'm not here to kind of say that this is the, the holy grail, the, the one-stop shop for uh, uh, post-operative infection and inflammation. So there certainly are some disadvantages, um, which I can talk, call as the other four C's here. So there's compounding pharmacy concerns. Um, uh, Dr. Arshana mentioned there was ph compounding pharmacy concerns in Canada. We had some issues with here in the United States with 503A compounding pharmacies. And again, the problem is that these are pharmacies that are not subjected to regulations by the government. And so um, there are some reports of endophthalmitis from trimcinol and moxifloxacin injection. However, in this paper in JCRS in December of 2018, this was not from any of the uh, uh, imprimis um, uh, uh, formulated uh, trimoxy injections. So that's one of the Cs. There is a little bit of the complaints. So there's a little bit of a decreased wow factor because we can get subconjunctival hemorrhage, pain. Uh, about 70% of patients will report the floater the very next day. And we've educated our pre-op people as well as our post-op people to explain to the patients that the floater is normal. I kind of actually talk it up to them by saying it's good that you're seeing your floater because that's the antibiotic and steroid that's fighting off the in inflammation and uh, potential infection that can happen. And uh, the vast majority of these floaters will have disappeared by the one week visit. But there is a little bit of a, a, a little bit of hand holding that must be done, especially with patients who are pre uh, paying for premium IOLs and are expecting the 2025 vision. Uh, with, with this approach, may, many patients are about 20, 30, 20, 40 post-op day one, but by post-op week one, they are where we uh, uh, expect 
with the topical group where they're seeing the 2025-2020 by post-op week one. Uh, continued inflammation, which we can describe as either persistent anterior chamber inflammation. This is uh, AC inflammation that just kind of never goes away. There is another group of rebound where the uh, AC cell and flare will go away uh, after one week, but may come back anywhere from the one week to the one month visit. And of course, CME, and I'll talk a little bit about these three in some of the next coming slides. And finally, the catastrophe, HORV, which is thought to be an immune reaction to intraocular vancomycin. Again, no cases of HORV were reported with the Imprimis formulation, but because of that, we switched to using Trimoxy only since 2017. And uh, we have not had any uh, HORV even when we were using Trimoxyvanc, but nevertheless, because of the uh, joint uh, statement made by both the ASCRS as well as the ASRS, we have now switched to using tri a Trimoxin only. Uh, we recently published this paper just last month where we uh, did a comparative study of IVAS injection uh, with topical medications. This was 1,058 eyes. And, and really the, what we were able to do is we, we compared uh, Trimoxyvanc uh, injection after uncomplica uh, uncomplicated fake or flax. Uh, obviously we did not have enough power in the study to comment on clinical end up phlematis. So uh, our uh, data or our results were primarily focused on uh, the effectiveness, effectiveness of this uh, against uh, uh, inflammation. Uh, we, like I said, we had both patients from a teaching hospital setting as well as a suburban private practice setting so that we weren't cherry picking our data. And this was data from two surgeons. So that, again, it wasn't just sort of the, the pros and cons of one surgeon uh, data. We had a 12 month follow-up period and we found that the uh, best corrective visual acuity was the same between both the control, that was the topical drops group as well as the treatment group. Uh, the, the rates of uh, uh, persistent anterior chamber inflammation as well as rebound was similar uh, in the control versus treatment. However, we found that in the uh, CME, uh, there was a slightly higher amount of CME in the IVAS injection group, again, because these patients were not given topical uh, NSAIDs. So what we concluded was that IVAS was effective for the control of anterior chamber uh, inflammation, both persistent and rebound. However, it may be ineffective for preventing CME. I think this may be due to a lack of an NSAID. So what we've uh, further, uh, when we looked at our results, we further tried to categorize people that have risk factors that why uh, will certain patients have a higher incident of ocular inflammation? And what we found is that the following risk factors such as diabetic retinopathy, evidence of ERN, history of uveitis, young age, a uh, grade of cataract, and surprisingly femtosecond laser cystic cataract surgery, all of these were predictors of higher amounts of inflammation and these patients had a higher rate of anterior segment inflammation as well as cystoid macular edema. And among those, the uh, diabetic retinopathy, the density of the cataract, as well as flax, these were the ones that were the most predictive. And so what we've now uh, looking to work is towards looking at the preoperative assessment and allocating values for risk factors for, um, which may help predict which patients are more likely to be inflamed after surgery and to determine that these patients can still be given an IVAS injection, but would likely benefit from additional supplemental topical therapy of steroids or, and or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And here's the algorithm that we are currently working on and we're currently studying. Uh, we assigned uh, point values for patients uh, who have these risk factors, like you can see diabetic retinopathy, uh, FLAC, standard FACO, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the density of the cataract. And once we have a point value system, we are now stratifying patients into um, low, let me go to the next slide here, uh, low risk, medium risk, and high risk patients. So the low risk patients we've determined can safely receive IVAS without any topical therapy supplementation. The medium risk patients we've determined can re receive an IVAS, but strongly consider augmentation with either topical steroids or non-steroidals. And as far as the high risk patients, we say they can get IVAS, but we must supplement them with uh, topical therapy, uh, either topical steroids and or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And what we've currently done since uh, uh, 2017, uh, so we're currently gathering data uh, on with this now cohort of patients, is that all diabetic patients are getting a topical NSAID, uh, either a Prolenza or Ketorolac, uh, depending on insurance uh, coverage there. Medium risk patients are getting either a topical steroid or a topical NSAID and high-risk patients are getting both a topical steroid and a topical NSAID. Again, we're using a lower dose for the full one month so that we feel that we're kind of supplementing the amount of the trincinolone that is inside the eye. 
And finally, the future directions and conclusions. So what we currently uh, believe is that IVAS may be an efficacious option for low risk patients after routine uncomplicated cataract surgery that has significant advantages, which we've termed the five C's. However, potential shortcomings should also be kept in mind, which we've talked about as the four C's. We believe that the IVAS technique is fairly easy to learn for most anterior segment surgeons. Uh, the vitreous is not a forbidden zone. We can enter the vitreous uh, safely and effectively. And in our uh, series of patients now in the past four, uh, five years, we have not had any uh, issues with uh, uh, retinal detachments or any other uh, issues of the posterior segment. Uh, understanding risk factors for uh, both um, uh, anterior chamber inflammation as well as um, uh, CME can help surgeons stratify patients into various risk profiles so that we can see which patients may benefit from supplemental topical therapy and more research is needed in this area to optimize patient outcomes, including a, a stratifying patients who can truly be dropless, as well as those patients who can be less drops. In other words, they can get the injection, but use less frequent drop uh, type of a patient population. And finally, uh, these are my children. This is uh, Rabia, who I invented the Rabia forceps after. And now my wife has said that I have to invent two more instruments after Nabil and Zainab. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see where that leads us. So thank you all for your kind intention. And I'm gonna turn my screen off and uh, turn it back to uh, our dear moderator, uh, Dr. Hassan Ziada. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cameron, for the, the wonderful presentation as usual. And I was lucky to spend uh, two days in Cairo uh, with um, <clears throat> a great person like you. And uh, I, I, I have to say that you went to the pyramids, also Lalit, Lalit yeah. went, but Steve, not yet. <laughs> uh, when, when we arranged it with Dr. Steve to, um, to host him in Cairo, the coronavirus pandemic uh, did another thing, uh, hoping to, to be with us uh, in Cairo soon. Hope so. uh, uh, th thank you, Kamran. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but because, sorry, because it's too late in India now, I, I, I will ask you to postpone the questions after getting the presentation of uh, my dear uh, friend and teacher, Dr. Ladit Verma, to be free uh, to stay after his pre presentation because it's beyond midnight uh, uh, in India now. Uh, Dr. Lalit Verma will tell us uh, if, we, we, if, we, if one of us uh, is unlucky and in despite of the intracameral drugs of Dr. Archinov or the intravitreal injection of Dr. Cameron, uh, the, the bacteria was uh, uh, stronger than the drugs and caused endothelmites, what we have to do and when to do. Uh, so please, Dr. Lalit, give us your oh. valuable presentation. Is the slides visible to everybody? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, greetings uh, from this land of Taj Mahal. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum. Namaste to all the dear friends and colleagues from Egypt, as Aikum. well as to Steve. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Alaikum salam. And I'm really thankful to uh, my friend, Dr. Hussain, for asking me to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, uh, CME along with uh, Professor Steve. And uh, it was very fascinating to hear Dr. cataract surgery by Dr. Cameron. There are a lot of questions. I think if time permits, we will definitely uh, deliberate upon that. Endothelmitis, uh, you see, like you rightly said, despite uh, prophylactic antibiotics, whether you inject intracamerally or as Dr. Cameron says, intravitrally, end of still bothers everybody. Even EVS study could collect more than 400 patients in US. So all the incidence is decreasing because of a fantastic surgery, which all of you do. But believe me, even a single case gives a lot of stress to a surgeon who operates. People who don't operate, uh, they in any case are stress, stressless. But people who operate, they, you know, even one case is very stressful. And sometimes if you have cluster, then uh, you have to close the operation facility. So I just put this slide after hearing uh, uh, my friend Hussam. So he said a person is unhappy. So this makes an operating surgeon very unhappy. This is what uh, everybody promises. And this is what can happen, which is very serious. 
and devastating. How to save this size? Follow what uh, Steve said or follow what Cameron said. Take all these uh, prophylactic measures, including intracameral, and I'll include intravitreal also later on. But important is in case you are unfortunate or patient is unfortunate, early diagnosis and prompt treatment is important. Once the bacteria enters the vitreous cavity, I think it's, it's dangerous for the eye. And the key issue, which I believe is delay and delay. Two delays. One delay is that you fail to differentiate from TAS, which Dr. Hossam has very nicely described. And other delay is you postpone the treatment by a couple of days. Standard thyroiditis, if you don't treat in time, believe me, it can spell disaster. Disaster for you, for your practice, for patient, his family because his eye is doomed. And if you don't manage in time or don't manage properly, it is like murdering an eye. It is amongst your murder of the eye. Eye goes into thysis bulbi. This chart, I think uh, 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 Dr. Hossam also showed, but just to recollect, TAS presents very early, limbus to limbus cordial edema. Lid, lid swelling or ecchymosis, it does not occur in TAS. So any patient who has lid swelling and chemosis is in fa favor of infectious hemophilomitis. And IOP, intraocular pressure, is generally low in patients who have infection, primarily because there is an element of cyclitis. But typically in TAS, it may be slightly on the higher side. And B-scan, because it is anterior in TAS, it is anechoic. Although a posterior variety of TAS is also described. So these are few features which can tilt the scale between TAS and infection. So I'll show you only two patients which I just added. This was one of my patients uh, who had unusual post-operative reaction. Unusual means without uh, any trauma to the iris or any unusual maneuvers, this patient had this kind of uh, reaction. So what I do in such patients is Treat them with intensive steroids. Do not give any intravitreal antibiotic. Do not give any intravitreal steroids. But very important is to monitor very, very closely. So this patient was lucky and so was I. This patient improved within a few days to 6 by 6 vision. Only topical steroid drops given. So this was another patient who had had limbus to limbus coronary edema. You see, she, this patient had previous RK surgery done long time back. And notice the color of this vitreous opacity is whitish. This is what uh, tilted my thought process that it could be an inflammatory reaction rather than infectious. So we treated this patient with steroids and gradually, gradually over the course of a few days. Very important, believe me, is to follow up these patients virtually every day or sometimes twice a day also. And you see, after two weeks, this patient had very good glow, coronary edema gone, and media clarity improved, and visual gain, 6 by 9. But any patient who has had, you know, where the differentiation is difficult between TAS versus end of thalmitis, so if any patient complains of unusual pain, which you are not used to seeing, or decreased vision after initial gain, or presence of significant lead edema, chemosis, hypopion, or yellowish colored vitreous exudates, or obscuration of fundus glow, always, always think of infection rather than inflammation. So, intravitreal antibiotics are the mainstay in management, provided you have given them early and provided the organisms are sensitive enough. And results are pretty good in patients who have mild to moderate infection in the vitreous cavity. So this is one of the booklet which uh, All India Ophthalmic Society had brought, which contains everything about practical management of enthelmitis. And this is the chart which uh, we gave to all our members to see how to prepare these uh, you know, drops. Because in the moment of crisis, a lot of people forget this dilution uh, uh, methods. So what we advocate is put this chart Stuck, stick it onto the wall of the operation theater so that you can 
make the drugs in the operation theater yourself. So this was uh, one of another patient who had had post-operative enteritis day four, and we gave intravitreal Venco and Captazidine, and gradually followed this patient up. And you can see after a couple of days, the senechia starts breaking, the glow starts coming back, and after a couple of weeks, this patient was lucky enough to gain six by six vision from initial vision of hand motions. But everybody may not be as lucky as uh, this patient. So their good response could be partial. That means hypopion may disappear, but the reaction still persists. The normal question is asked, do we go ahead and repeat injection or we consider the patient of vitrectomy? I, for one, have a very low threshold for doing a vitrectomy now with the modern MIVS surgery coming up. I do not give a second interval injection. I do not believe in repeating interval injection. Unless and until, unless and until the culture sensitive report just come is different than, than uh, the previous injection what we have given. So these are my indications which are suitable candidates for vitrectomy. Patients of severe inflammatitis patients who are not responding to the first antibiotic injection or very virulent cases which present on day one where generally we suspect pseudomonas or bleb related where streptococci are, uh, are the predominant organism or patient has PL vision only or the other definition which I consider is on ultrasonography if the exudates are extending up to the rectal surface and up to the ora serrata that means this patient has a lot of load of infection and this patient may not respond to conventional antibiotic treatment. Also patients who have post-traumatic anaphylmitis because they are multi or polymicrobial so possibility of response to injection may not be high. Patients who have fungal etiology, those antifungals even though voriconazole is there are, are not very good. Our patients who develop chronic and recurrent infections like something like proconium bacterium acne, they also are good candidates for vitrectomy. Or patients, if have associated detachment along with foreign body, then these patients are, are candidates for vitreous surgery. So how do we do vitrectomy in these patients? I will show you a couple of videos. I hope uh, they're visible. We no longer do a poor vitrectomy. We always believe in the concept of radical vitrectomy because I believe once you enter the vitreous cavity, it's better to remove each and every uh, you know, membrane or each and every exudate what is visible to the extent that sometimes we peel off the hyaluronic face also, do a PHF uh, peeling, go close to the retina, do a base dissection, do a indentation vitrectomy also, and do not hesitate to use silicon oil in patients with severe inflammations. So, uh, is this uh, video running? Hassan? Yes, okay. Yes, okay. Lalit, it, it, so it's, this was it's the run. patient. Who, it's running, the, but someone okay. slow, so be, uh, be uh, slow in your explanation. So I will, this was the patient who had a hypotonus globe. So what I did was with the help of a needle, we, we injected uh, saline inside the cavity just to tot up or to make it firm and then injected this six millimeter cannula, always straight in a patient of infection. We do not go tangentially, go straight. And then once the globe was firm, we made the other ports for vitrectomy. And I'm very fond of doing this superior iridectomy in this patient because I do not want to, uh, you know, enter from the limbus because it will make the globe further hypotenus. So we make this iridectomy and from that we enter the anterior chamber. So there are two ways to enter anterior chamber. One is through the pars plena, through the iridectomy, and then you can cut the membranes in the anterior chamber with the help of either an MVR blade or with the help of cutter. So this was another patient who had had uh, infection. So here we are using an AC maintainer. AC maintainer because the first step in all vitreous surgery is to clear off the anterior chamber 
of all the exudative material. Because if you do not clear the anterior chamber, vitrectomy is difficult because you cannot see the vitreous cavity and you do not do a good job. So here we are entering the anterior chamber with the help of a bent needle, we tease, we remove all this fibrinous membrane from the iris as well as from the IUL surface. And after this has been taken out, then we enter the vitreous cavity and do the proper vitrectomy. Now the media becomes clearer and you can do a definitive job. So this was another patient who had had infection and was referred to us. This patient had had multiple sutures here, indicating that surgery was complicated. So here again, we use this very useful instrument, AC maintainer. And even after that, frankly speaking, I could not see the trocar cannula. So I went back to the AC maintainer from the limbus area and then made these two ports and then did the complete vitrectomy with the help of this AC maintainer only. This was the glow. Another patient who had had this unfortunate endophthalmitis and as I said, the first job always is to make a stab incision, then put some viscose to protect the endothelium and then with the help of MVR blade, we tease this fibrinous exudative membrane over the surface of iris and pupil and remove this with the help of either visco expression or with the help of cutter or tease away with the help of MVR blade. And then you enter the vitreous cavity, do a total radical vitrectomy till the time you see all the fundus details as is being shown here, even to the extent of peeling these membranes with the help of diamond duster I am using here to peel all these membranes which are sticky on the surface of retina. So I do not hesitate to peel off the hyaloid also. So this was another patient who had had uh, post-operative endothelmitis. This patient also had this corneal abscess as you can see in the superior part. So again, we enter with MVR blade, put some visco to protect the endothelium and then take this bent needle and start teasing this exudative membrane over the surface of iris and the pupillary area. During this maneuver, this IUL got uh, mobilized and I removed this IUL because it was a very severe endothelmitis. Once the IUL came out, then you become more bold to enter with the help of cutter because you are working in an AFAK area now. Remove all these uh, membranes from the anterior chamber. Also pay attention to the connection between the caudal abscess and the intraocular cavity. Suture this area and then do a depression vitrectomy. I am doing depression here, working under microscope without any lens and then Finally, after one hour or so, we would see the glow. This was the patient, how he presented the corneal abscess and no glow. And then after this radical vitrectomy, this patient improved from perception of light to 6 by 24 after four weeks. This was the patient who had had multiple vitrectomies already done. And every time this patient will have recurrence, and the cause for recurrence was always this collection of subhyloid pockets of uh, infective material. So what was done was to peel off this hyaloid with the help of a back flush needle only. So this was the third treatment this patient was undergoing. And what we did was to, as you see, remove this hyaloid membrane because all this uh, collection is now under the hyaloid and this was the cause of recurrence every time. This was another patient of proven fungal endothelmitis. 
So this patient already had had received uh, voriconazole intravitrally, uh, but uh, response every time was recurrence. So this time we thought we will remove the intraocular lens also. So we had already prepared to, for removal of the lens by making this in smile incision here. And then we did the vitrectomy. And after doing most of the vitrectomy, entered the anterior chamber with the help of keratome and mobilized this IUL. And once the IUL got mobilized, we removed that and removed the entire capsular bag. It is very, very significant and important to remove this entire bag in one go and do not lose the grip of this bag. And since it was slippery at this point, I left it there only and entered from the parts plana. And depress, depress from the superior part and remove the, all the infective component. And then do a depression vitrectomy to take care of all the opacities in the vitreous and the membranes also. And fortunately for me, this patient, after this radical vitrectomy, you see this depression vitrectomy, a lot of collection of exudates in the, in the uh, ciliary body area. This was a patient of post-traumatic endothelmitis with this foreign body. You can see this magnetic foreign body here. But aim is not to rush to remove the foreign body. First do a total radical vitrectomy. Remove all this fibrinous material because this will be the cause of recurrence if you leave it behind. And do a total radical vitrectomy with depression. You see how much material is there in the uh, periphery of the retina, depress, depress and depress and remove as much as you can without compromising the structural integrity of the retina. Then I injected a perfluorocarbon bubble here and with the help of rare earth magnet which we introduced, remove this foreign body. Enlarge the incision before that, this foreign body then comes out easily. So this was another patient who had that corneal melt. So in this, this patient, uh, you take help of a cornea colleague because he will come and assist you to remove this corneal button and do a temporary keratoprosthesis. Because otherwise, I am not very familiar with the concept of endoscopic vitrectomy, which is another alternative. So we did this temporary keratoprosthesis here. Most of the infection in such pain generally is confined to the anterior part only. So in this patient, the, all the melted button of the cornea is removed with the help of scissors, mana scissors, put some visco. And after this is removed, suture the keratoprosthesis in place as is being shown here and after you have done that do a vitrectomy fortunately in the vitreous cavity there was not much severe infection and it was not a difficult vitrectomy in this so after that you remove this keratoprosthesis and replace it with the coronal graft so this was uh, one of recently operated during corona time only. This patient had undergone glaucoma surgery. So we follow the same principles as I had shown below uh, before. So this was the patient with radical vitrectomy, patient presented with virtually PL plus minus kind of vision. This is silicon oil reflexes. You can see patient improved to finger counting three meters vision. So this was another patient who underwent IUL removal also. And this was done in COVID era only April and the, the technique for removal of uh, IUL, we generally cut the IUL. So straight, in, straight entry into the vitreous cavity because this will bypass the thick choroid. Then interior chamber entry with trocar cannula, 
put visco through another stab incision then try to do synecure lysis remove this pigmentary membrane from the surface of iul and during this process a lot of uh, purulent material started coming out some some visco again we took material for culture sensitivity also and then ultimately i had to put uh, iris detectors because visibility was not much and after that i mobilized the iul from the back and brought it into the anterior chamber and once the iul got mobilized option was to make a big incision so what we did was to cut this iul in the in the anterior chamber itself with the help of scissors the optic part is cut till the center of the optic and after it has been cut you can see this till halfway we have cut the advantage is then you can remove this uh, iul with a smaller incision you see how much this has been cut half you rotate this because the fulcrum then becomes the the this uh, part where you have cut this was the post operative uh, photograph after one day 27th use of rate 28 from inaccurate projection to finger counting vision in one day so thus to conclude uh, vitrectomy is required in patients who do not respond uh, uh, to antibiotics and the tips are needle infusion just to firm up the globe or make it taut ac maintainer 6 mm camera and always a straight entry and ac management is of paramount importance and remove all the membrane from the anterior chamber iris and sometimes iul also and after that do a complete vitrectomy with indentation intraocular foreign body removal is the last after doing a adequate vitrectomy and phf removal if it is safe you should do and silicone oil injection if it is a very very severe infection i do not hesitate to put in the soil and very important is a close follow up in these patients what silicone oil does it compartmentalizes into anterior and posterior segment the posterior segment is virtually reduced to a very thin uh, area which is amenable to systemic antibiotics and anterior segment what is left is amenable to topical antibiotic treatment and silicone oil itself is impervious to any kind of organism so there is an advantage of using silicone oil in combination with radical vitrectomy in a core vitrectomy you cannot inject silicone oil but if you done a complete vitrectomy you can inject silicone oil it helps to save lot of these eyes thank you very much for this opportunity thank you dr lalit for this uh, great presentation getting uh, the hope for the endophthalmites uh, the, the the eyes of endophthalmites and the surgeons too um, uh, um, uh, i wish for all uh, to be avoided from this horrible complication <clears throat> despite the old pictures was uh, hurting uh, the, uh, hurting at the start but the vitrectomy is still giving the hope for the miserable eyes to be cheerful one thank you very much Uh, let me to ask you a question about the timing of vitrectomy. Uh, when to when to say this? The, I have to do vitrectomy for this eye and could be beneficial for to save this eye. So vitrectomy earlier the better. You see, first line of management is antibiotics. If yes. patient does not respond, uh, say to one or two days. You see, I do wait for uh, 48 to 78 hours to assess the response. but uh, i intervene very early because i do not want uh, cornea to get hazy or or uh, or membranes to form so earlier the better if you go earlier into the vitreous cavity results of surgery are better compared to if you uh, delay okay but but if if you find a patient uh, 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 comes to you in, in the clinic with vitrectomy where was sorry with endophthalmites Uh, what, what to find to to take the, dis, the decision immediately to do a vitrectomy without wait without any waiting? Uh, what's the criteria? I mean, what's the criteria to find in the eye, in the cornea, in the anterior chamber, in the vitreous, in the vision? 
so so yeah the criteria are if the visual if vision is very poor very poor means even if it is not hand motions finger counting is not there if the patient has only pl kind of vision and 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 the and the vitreous cavity is full of exudation or if the vitreous is not full and patient has vision of hand motions or better i will first try internal antibiotics so, uh, full of exudation with ultrasound or what yeah. Yeah. yeah ultrasound is not for diagnosis but is not required for diagnosis of endothelitis but it does help to plan the management okay, if the, but even if, even if the patient has not received any internal antibiotic i will mentally start preparing him for vitrectomy even though i may give mineral injection as the first line of management but i will have a dialogue with the patient that if this injection does not work i may subject you to a more definitive surgery of debulking the uh, you know the purulent material from the vitreous so that the response to antibiotics also improves so counseling and talking is very important Okay. Uh, what well, what about the cordial uh, uh, infiltration? If you find the patient with the cordial infiltration, but the vitreous is still clear, uh, or 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 ne never to be clear, I think, but 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 with 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 very mild to moderate uh, uh, reaction, uh, uh, would you go to uh, to 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 do a vitrectomy in such patient before losing the corneal transparency? so cornea cornea is the biggest enemy for any vitreous surgeon yeah because if cornea is uh, not yeah. good yeah. Uh, i can't see yeah. so if 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 in such scenario vitreous cavity as you said is not too much involved i will give injection and take help from my corneal colleague <clears throat> uh, okay to do something for the cornea like uh, prosthesis or, uh, or 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 so uh, i leave it leave it to him to manage okay if you, if you then find this option Uh, can you do a, 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 a blind vitrectomy, a cord vitrectomy blindly? You can, you no, can, you can no. do that. Never, okay. never. Yeah. Okay. I will not. Uh, it's very I will, important. I will, in in such scenario, I will rely on intravitreal antibiotics. I will never do a, a blind vitrectomy because you know that is uh, fraught with uh, danger. Yeah. Okay. I'm asking this question because because I found uh, someone who who uh, went for that. Because of the corneal opacity, for with a corneal uh, uh, abscess or corneal infiltration, but there is no, there was no facility for the crowd prosthetic implant at that time, so he he aimed at core vitrectomy, uh, keeping the the, uh, the the rules of the vitrectomy to lessen the the burden of infection of the intraocular infection. So I'm asking this question now. So the aim, aim, his aim is very good. His yeah. aim is very good to reduce the load, but yeah. his technique is not good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Doctor Abdul Basit. I think you have a question. I have some comments. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for okay. this wonderful presentation. Uh, do you think? Uh, Endosalmitis vitrectomy study still applicable between uh, all of salmonellosis because I saw most of vitreoretinal surgeons prefer to do vitrectomy as early as possible regardless of the visual acuity. Most of vitreoretinal surgeons I saw him prefer to do vitrectomy uh, uh, even the patient uh, vision is still 60-60 or better. Yeah, okay. This do you prefer that? Very good question for Dr. Lalit because they are they are scared and uh, having the fear of losing the eye, they may go for earlier vitrectomy. Uh, what's your opinion, sir? So, uh, the, so patient who has good vision, that means uh, six by sixty or better, that means they do not have a severe form of endophthalmitis. That is mild to moderate. So, in vitrectomy for endophthalmitis, there could be two scenarios. One is first. First aim is to control the infection, so that can be done in such patients with the help of antibiotics. And then you can do a secondary kind of vitrectomy to get rid of, you see, opacities in the vitreous or any complications like membranes or or maybe uh, uh, some other uh, epithelial membrane. But to control the infection, to control the because the aim of aim of treatment is to first control the infection. So if patient has six by sixty vision. 
I may not be so aggressive to go inside as the first line of management. I will still, you know, uh, restrict myself to intravitreal antibiotics for control of infection. And then I may do a secondary vitreotomy later on. Or if the patient is not responsive to the injection. Dr. Uh, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Uh, most of vitreotomy surgery, uh, because the rapid deterioration of uh, of the condition in cases of end of mites, most of uh, cases yeah. we see, we saw the, there is rapid deterioration because uh, so they take the decision as early as possible, uh, not uh, waiting the deterioration and uh, then I will do vitreotomy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you, Dr. Muhammad, on this. But you see, uh, last slide I showed was follow up. So follow up is every day. Yeah. So patient who has six by sixty vision, in all probability will not deteriorate. To if you have given interval antibiotic and if the organism is sensitive, it will not go down so bad within one day from six by sixty to PL. If the organism is sensitive, if they are not, in any case, I will also go inside and do vitreotomy. I told you that I have very low threshold for vitreotomy. I also want to go inside vitreous very early and prevent uh, all sort of complications. But yeah. patient was 6 by 60, in all probability, he will uh, respond. If it does not, then I don't hesitate to go. I, I agree with you. Okay, I uh, think... Dr. Uh, Dr. Liat, uh, uh, excuse Dr. Hassam. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I see uh, you with uh, the, this, uh, with, uh, with the, when you share the, your uh, case of vitrectomy, you are close to the retina. Uh, I Dr. think... Uh, Dr. Uh, I think a core vitrectomy uh, in case of end of salmitis because the retina is a demotosifiable uh, uh, me we are f fear of uh, retinal tear what about uh, that? Okay, Dr. Lalit. So, so uh, you see uh, I am not a proponent of core vitrectomy at all because uh, I believe once you enter the vitreous cavity you see those days of 20 gauge vitrectomy are now gone we nowadays uh, do 25 gauge uh, surgery so once you enter, why leave anything behind? I'm not very happy to just see the disc and the vessels and the macula and come out. I will not leave behind any residue infection at all. The reason is to prevent recurrences also. In mild patients or moderate patients, this will work. But in patients who have severe infection, by severe I mean vision PL plus and exudates which are up to the retina surface or up to the ciliary body. So in such patients, where, where the exudates are up to the retinal surface, if you do a core vitreotomy, then recurrences are very common. So in such patients, I will not hesitate to go close to the retina. Yeah, we may say that the situation will help your decision to be closer to the retina or not. Uh, Dr. Muhammad abdel Basit means that um, uh, uh, it's, it's so somewhat uh, dangerous to to be closer to the retina because it's edematous and uh, and it's uh, it's very vulnerable to be detached or to be torn, right, Abdul Basit? Yes. Uh, so, 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 so what I wanted to say was in mild to moderate endophthalmitis, I will not go close to the retina. Yeah. Only, I in, severe, this, yes. only in very severe, only in very severe, because then you have to weigh risk benefit ratio. And if so you find is, and, the and risk the, is damage to retina, but the benefit is clearance of infection. Even if I create a break, this is still manageable compared to if I leave the infection there. And, and if, if in case of, uh, of a lot of retinal membranes, which may, which may cover a source of reinfection or recurrence of the infection behind or inside, uh, and, if, and if you could to remove or to uh, peel these uh, membranes, you will do, keeping, keeping the, the, uh, the precautions. And also, Dr. Lalit, I think you, you, you told about the silicone oil injection after, if you, if you got some, uh, uh, some uh, troubles with re or some worry about, about retina, you, you can compensate and tamponade your retina with the silicone oil. And I, I think silicone oil may help decreasing the recurrence because it's not favorable environment for the organisms, right? Silicone oil creates unfavorable environment for the organism. Yeah. Yeah, because yes. how, how we started nearly more than uh, uh, more than one and a half decade, two decades back, was like uh, like Dr. Muhammad was saying, we were operating a patient with anomalies, and we created a break, iatrogenic break. It happened. Yeah. It happened. So I was forced to use silicone oil in that situation. 
Prior to that, we were never injecting silicone oil. So in that patient, we created a complication, we created a break, then we became slightly more bold to remove all the infection and ultimately injected oil. So this patient ultimately got saved and recovered 6 by 60 vision. Yeah. And now this patient then taught us a lesson that don't worry about the break, clear the infection that is more uh, you know useful for the patient rather than rather than leading the infection. Yeah, let's say that the main clue or the main key is a is a close a very close follow up. You can uh, uh, even we can say it about by the way to set this patient in your clinic, don't discharge this patient to be uh, for to be very close to you every six hours you can check for, uh, for the eye status to define if it's deteriorating or not. If deteriorating, you can go for the vitrectomy earlier, as you said, Abdul Basit. If, you, if, you, if there is an improvement, even a little bit improvement, you can stay for the intravitreal injections, Professor, of antibiotics and let it. This is absolutely before, true. Before, Professor, yes. before we, whenever there is confusion between improvement or no improvement, I yeah. do see the patient morning, evening, and if there is a slightest deterioration, we go inside. Okay, but the, the, the evaluation is not by the vision. I think at the, at the, this early time, not by the vision, by, yes, by, the, yes. by, the, yeah, by the picture of the anterior and posterior chamber, uh, segments of the eye. Before going to the, the, the other questions, uh, I, I, uh, Dr. Steve has um, some uh, questions for Dr. Lalit. Well, no, I had a few uh, comments on the discussion so far. First, uh, Lalit, I, th I think your presentation was excellent. And I'd like to thank God that I have no patients that had to go to you. <laughs> because, uh, I, uh, I hope not to have such terrible patients. I've, they, some of your colleagues doing retina surgery are yeah. present in Toronto, and I fortunately I rarely need them, which is uh, how I like to have my life. Yeah, uh, I'd like to comment on, on Dr. Kamran's uh, uh, discussion, if possible. Yes. And, and I, I don't want to appear to be mean, but there's a number of things that, that kind of bother me. One of them is that you're American. I have nothing wrong with Americans except that everyone in the world has something against a few Americans, but the Americans tend to be very inward looking and they look at how the FDA looks at things and approves things and they think the rest of the world agrees with that. It turns out that I consulted for the FDA for 20 years about uh, approving drugs and devices and things. And the approval you have for uh, drugs is done by the drug company looking for the cheapest way to get the drug approved. That's always for conjunctivitis. So telling us that a drug is not approved for the indication we want to use it for, to me and probably everyone else in the world, is completely irrelevant. It just means the cheapest way to get the drug approved in the US was for conjunctivitis. I don't actually care. Uh, you know, I, as a doctor, I want to use the drug for what I think it works for and what the body of evidence of other physicians and surgeons shows me it works for. And what the company in the U.S. found to be the cheapest way for approval, I think, well, very nice. That's the American laws. And you guys have to live by that, and that's the way it goes. So that was my first comment. My second comment was about the cost in the U.S. Being next door to you guys, Americans routinely come across the border to buy drugs in Canada because the the, in the last five years, the cost of drugs in the U.S. has become beyond astronomical. So when you tell me that it costs 323 American dollars, for the post-op eye drops for one eye that a patient pays in the US. In Canada, it costs about $23 if the patient pays for them. And that's Canadian dollars. That's only 75 cents a dollar. So it's about $18 for American money. And that the government pays for also. So the patient may pay $2. So to us, it's completely irrelevant. And the fact that the US has this ridiculous structure of paying for drugs, well, I feel sorry for you guys, but that's just the way it is in the US. And the next comments were not about only being American, but other issues. You mentioned about the concentration of the drugs that you inject. And you told me that the concentration you inject is higher than what I use. Actually, you inject a dose that is not therapeutic because you have one milligram per mil of oxyfloxacin, but you only inject 0.1 mil. That's 100 micrograms. That's one sixth the dose we put in the anterior chamber. And that dose has been shown in the Japanese studies to be subtherapeutic and to not treat whatsoever the resistant strains. Okay, yeah. and comment on, on one second, because it's two, two drugs. Okay, sure, go ahead. Commented about the fact that some of the patients will need extra post-op steroids and non-steroidals because you don't treat CME well, and some may get post-op inflammation. 
So you're telling me that that drug too, you're giving really a sub-therapeutic dose. The talk that I gave, not that I'm the best guy in the world, but I have my opinions, is I want to treat the patients with a super maximal dose for the first four days to totally prevent any inflammation or infection. And I found in many, many years uh, that that works. And perhaps unfortunately or fortunately, I've been in practice for longer than many of you guys have been alive. But, um, and I find that that works. And I, I don't like when people give subtherapeutic doses because you will sooner or later get an infection and you will find diabetics and others get breakout infection, inflammation, particularly if you treat brown eyes. And you know, all of you guys except me have brown eyes. Uh, and if you're treating people that have you know, darker pigmentation and brown eyes, they're the ones that will break through with inflammation at two weeks or so post-op. And I don't want that to happen because in Toronto, we have the most cosmopolitan city in the world. And at least a half of the patients that I operate on are either black or from India or from China that have dark, dark eyes. And if I don't treat them with a, a therapeutic dose, they're going to have a problem. So those are my comments. Sure. Uh, so, so let me try to respond to, to each of those. So, so first, you know, these slides primarily were made for a U.S. audience that I try to modify and retrofit for an international audience. And I, and I think I, I did comment that, you know, some of this may not be applicable for some of our international colleagues. You know, I had the fortune when I was a resident to uh, spend a couple of weeks in India to do cataract surgery, and we were uh, astonished at how cheap the, the same uh, Vigamox and Pred and things like that uh, that we use in the U.S. were, were available uh, in India. So, and my wife is from Canada and from Toronto, so I do have a lot of love and respect for the Canadians. In fact, I've, tell, I've told her to keep her Canadian citizenship because I never know what's going to happen here. But, uh, I mean, that's a fair point regarding the, um, the, the, the cost as well as, you know, the, the indication that we currently use. I mean, it, it was, it, I've made this, uh, I've given this presentation in front of U.S. colleagues and they're shocked and surprised, many of them, to know that. Uh, the on-label or the, uh, the use of topical antibiotics and steroids that we use um, in, in terms of cataract surgery is technically off-label, but it's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek because we all do it anyway. So, so that's sort of my response to the first two. The, 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 the third point is um, while we are giving, I guess, um, you somewhat are comparing apples and oranges because when we inject things into the anterior chamber, we're allowing for uh, appropriate turnover that's going to happen in the anterior chamber. Uh, at, at that uh, concentration. So when we're injecting 0.15 ml, not 0.1 ml, uh, into the vitreous, so even though it is at a lower concentration, we are so, and I, I admit that we are comparing a little bit of apples to oranges because the even though we're using lower concentration, my argument is that because it's in the vitreous cavity, there's a lower turnover there. And so therefore, we, what we're finding is that we're able to maintain the same effectiveness. Again, again I'm only commenting about inflammation because I don't have the numbers to, uh, you know, because we'll need about 100,000 eyes to comment about endothelitis. But at least for, even though we have lower amounts of trimcinolone um, in, the, um, in the vitreous cavity, that we're finding that it's still effective to be able to control um, at least anterior segment um, inflammation. And certainly the next phase of our studies would be to get an, uh, uh, an injectable non-steroidal uh, medication, for example, that can be given or to supplement it with appropriate use of uh, topical anti-inflammatories. And so I think I, I concluded in my, in my final slide that this isn't the be-all, end-all study. I mean, this is maybe what my studies are is probably what your studies were back in the, the late 90s, where, you know, there, there's still a lot of work to be done. And so, um, so that's where we're kind of now looking at which patients would truly benefit from intravitreal injection and just fire and forget, we don't have to worry about anything topical, and which patients may benefit from topical um, anti-inflammatories. And it's possible that there is a group of patients that may benefit from topical um, antibiotics as well too. So uh, my introduction to this topic is really just to say that uh, I think we need to think beyond just uh, drops and look at how we can actually get a bolus of, of inject a medication into the eye um, that can either be a standalone effective or at least be uh, used in conjunction with some of the topical medications. So, <clears throat> okay, okay, Doctor uh, Steve, do you have another comments? Well, I, I still think that the the dose of the moxifloxacin is in 150 micrograms, which, when it does dilute and leach around the eye, is insufficient to call, to treat the most resistant strains in the world. And so you, you probably will kill 
the sensitive uh, methicillin sensitive staph aureus, but won't kill the others. It, 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 it's yeah. a fair point, and again, and that's why our study did not look at the treatment of endophthalmitis. But it's it's a very fair point that I freely agree with you on that, and it's possible that maybe a combination of intravitreal injection, as we're doing, <clears throat> along with an intracameral moxifloxacin, uh, may be the way to go. Okay, it's uh, it's actually a very good idea. The great one to inject at the end of the operation. The, this this little syringe, yeah. Okay, Dr. Lalit. Uh, to, to yeah, I, see, uh, I I uh, okay, I, I am very fascinated by Dr. Cameron's talk because uh, on one hand we heard Steve about intracameral, and on the other hand we had Dr. Cameron intravitreal, and both are for prophylaxis, no infection but only prophylaxis, only for the fear that patient may develop infection. So. I agree that uh, you see uh, intravitreal seems more physiological because vitreous is the culture material for the for the bacteria to grow. But uh, mind you, it is prophylactic. It seems slightly more aggressive and overkill. Maybe uh, uh, you know, but some concerns were there. Like uh, why disturb the vitreous first? You say vitreous does not get disturbed. Second was what about fungal infections? If they can also occur, and third was problem of floaters because any injection you give in the vitreous cavity is bound to disturb vitreous for the entire life. Yeah, so we so I can answer the third part. Um, I, as I mentioned, uh, about seventy percent of patients in our study did report a post-op uh, day one floater, which um, by week one for all patients um, uh, went away. So there is a floater that we warn the patients about. We educate them, and in fact we. Uh, tell them that the floater is somewhat reassuring because it tells them that they have the infection uh, and, and inflammation prophylaxis uh, uh, inside the eye. And um, we, we do give patients the options uh, for uh, injection versus topical. And in my practice, I would say that over 95% of patients choose the, the, the with drops option. In fact, there are patients who come specifically seeking, I'm sorry, with, uh, with the injection option. In fact, there are patients who specifically come looking for the injection option because they, they've heard of that. Uh, as far as the second, uh, you know, fungal prophylaxis, I mean, that's a fair point, but I would then argue that none of the topical antibiotics, including the intracameral injection of MOXI, though MOXI has been shown to have some fungostatic effect, not a fungicidal effect, um, is, is, uh, is sufficient for antifungal uh, infection. But thankfully, after routine cataract surgery with good um, antiseptic and, and uh, uh, sterile technique, uh, the rate of fungal infections tends to be uh, thankfully, much uh, much lower, at least here in North America. It may be different in more tropical climates uh, uh, in the world. And finally, in terms of the uh, uh, disturbing the vitreous, and again, it's, it, it is a very fair point. Um, however, I think in the uh, era of intravitreal injections that we're now using for the treatment of AMD, diabetic retinopathy, our retina colleagues uh, are routinely disturbing the vitreous um, with very low rates of, uh, of complications. Having done this now for more than five years, knock on wood, we have not had a single uh, retinal tear or, or detachment. It may be a matter of time. I freely confess that I, I cannot definitively say that this is, again, the be-all, end-all. Um, but I, I would say that for many of our patients uh, that we have been now doing for, the, for five years, because of the advantages that it has offered, um, the vast majority of our patients are, are, are choosing in, uh, the intravitreal uh, injection. Um, so, so that's why we've become quite facile with delivering and performing intravitreal injection. It doesn't take much of our time. We give additional an, um, uh, anti anesthetic drops right before the injection. I'll usually have the circular come by and drop additional propericane on the eye, or we'll have a wax cell that's dipped in propericane or tetracaine that will apply right at the, at the air injection site. And the clip I showed, I specifically chose that uh, clip because it does show a little bit of patient shaking. And that's why gripping the uh, superior limbus with a 0.12 forceps is, uh, we found, has been very helpful to avoid uh, any uh, unnecessary, unwanted movement that can have devastating consequences. Cameron, as far as I can tell, the only benefit you have of giving the intravitreal injection is saving the patient getting eye drops. I understand giving intravitreal injections for AMD for diabetic retinopathy because you have a pathology there which you really have to treat or else the patient will lose their vision. One of the things that really worries me about giving vitreal injections and disturbing the vitreous when you have no really good reason to give it 
is you might cause posterior vitreous detachment. It can be traumatic. You'll cause epiretinal membranes. These are things that you're going to cause that I'm sure you and most people who do this don't study or look for. But if we follow our patients for a long time, we see that some people get that. And, you know, even a, a one in a thousand risk of getting an or macular hole is excessive as far as I'm concerned to avoid giving eye drops. Again, it, it, it's a fair point that you make, but um, like I'll say, like, uh, these are things that just have to be studied. I mean, we, we can't not do things because we're afraid. I think I would say that if we can, um, if, we, if we never took any risks and controlled risks, um, you know, for the longest time, FACO was considered to be, uh, you know, outlandish and the Academy of Ophthalmology actually condemned uh, Kelman for doing FACO, saying that the, the risks of FACO and certainly the early days of FACO outweighed the benefits of doing extra cap. So um, what I've shared here is probably still very early its infancy. Um, longer term studies certainly are needed and the technique has to be refined. But uh, you know, I would say that unle unless we take risks and, and you know, obviously calculable risks, I'm not saying that we return back to the days of couching to take cataracts out, um, you know, the, the, the risks of disturbing the vitreous uh, and, and these types of things need to be weighed hand in hand with the risks of Again, at least here in the United States, again, I'm biased with patients not affording their drops, not taking their drops. I've had one case of anophthalmitis in my seven years of practice post-training, and that was due to uh, a patient who was on drops and you know did, didn't, didn't take their drops and had very poor hygiene, had very long fingernails. So, so what I'm sharing here, I think, is not I'm not advocating for everybody to to take this approach. What I'm what I'm sharing, what I why I shared this is. I think this is something that warrants further study, and it, it may have some merit in the future, or it may be completely debunked um, by others who, who, who do this technique. But I think unless we take calculated risk, we as a profession uh, won't go forward. And I think the history of ophthalmology is marked by people who dared to be bold and, and were, uh, you know, dared to be stupid, uh, you know, intelligently. And, and I hope I'm trying to be stupid intelligently so that it can lead to something meaningful in the future. Uh, yes, Cameron, uh, your, your work is amazing, is attractive, but at the same time, it's controversial. Uh, so we, we, we have a lot of, uh, of questions and the question marks and uh, 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 points to be clarified about this, uh, this injection because uh, itself may carry the risk of infection. Only the injection of um, intravitreally of uh, of a steroid or tramcine alone carry the risk of increased intraocular pressure and secondary glaucoma at the, at the same time. So it may be beneficial and more beneficial in patients with the, the less or zero risk about that and at the same time with pathology in the retina for the fear of the, the cystoid macular edema postoperatively. Uh, at the same time, we, ha we have a problem which is the medical legal. The medical legal issue of this work because uh, it's it's not uh, well known or it's not allowed here to discharge the patient without the post-operative treatment. Mm -hmm. If if I discharge the, the patient with without post-operative eye drops for a time, I, I think I, I I may I may put my patient uh, on uh, just two weeks of post-operative treatment, and I, I think I'm one of the shortest surgeons to do that. Uh, uh, after surgery, but at the same time, if I discharge this, charge this patient on this short in this treatment, uh, sorry, on this injection without postoperative eye drops, if, if anything happened to this patient, I would I would be put in the jail because one of the medical legal issues here that the patient should be treated for 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 a time after the surgery. Uh, I think you you understand this point, but uh, I agree with you for protection of the patient, for the prophylaxis of the patient, especially in the cases of the the, the lack of compliance. If you, if you do not trust your patient to follow the instructions, please please. There's one of the unmuted persons here. There is echoes or, or there is voices around. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm with the intracameral drugs. And at the same time, with the intravitreal drugs together to cover the both anterior and posterior segments from the risk of infection. What's your opinion? What's the opinion of Steve and Lalit? 
I'll, I'll just comment on the, the IOP. I, I didn't mention it in the slide, but in the paper that we, that we uh, published, we, we did um, use it in patients who uh, receive, for example, concurrent eye stent. Um, and we, we compared the injection group with the uh, control group, and we did not find any significant increase in IOP spike of more than 10 millimeters mercury um, between the two groups. So, um, so, so we found that, you know, I would not use it in somebody who has, for example, um, you know, severe glaucoma or is ready to get a trab or a tube. But, um, you know, I, I have now switched primarily to doing, if I'm going to do a MIGS procedure, uh, I do a lot of phaco ABIC, um, ABIC. It's kind of my preferred procedure of choice, especially with a good trabecular meshwork. And we will routinely inject those patients with uh, trimoxivanc. I think the key, again, is the uh, digital palpation of the cornea at the conclusion of the surgery and making sure that if the IOP is high, that we, um, um, you know, burp a little bit of the fluid out. So that's something that I can comment on is that we've not seen any significant IOP spikes or uh, uncontrolled glaucoma develop from the injection of trimcinolone, uh, moxifloxacin, um, it, it, and, and again, in a, in a, even in patients with mild to moderate glaucoma, I have not been cavalier or bold enough to inject it in patients with severe glaucoma, or at least with those who have significant visual field deficits. Yeah, okay, there's, there's a, a question arising to my head now, which is very important in, my, in our practice. Uh, 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 this question is for all, even Dr. Lalit, because he's a veterinary surgeon, if you have a patient with, with macular edema, di diabetic macular edema, and at the same time, this patient has cataract, significant cataract. It's not, uh, it's not severely or not um, uh, uh, very dense cataract, but a significant density. Uh, uh, wh what to do to, to, to treat the, the, the um, cystoid or the macular edema first and to wait the time up till the retina is dry, the macula is dry, or to do FACO combined with injection at the same time, because uh, I, I, I have a lot of, um, of controversy about the combined FACO with intravitreal injection of anti-VGF or, or triamcinolone at the same session. What's your opinion, starting with Dr. Ledit? Unmute yourself. Uh, you yeah. see, uh, if this is a very pertinent question and a very important case scenario, which we see virtually uh, very commonly in our practice. You see if the cataract is significant, you see we have to wait two things. What is the degree of edema? How much is the cataract? And how much is the visual handicap the patient has? Because diabetic macular edema is not a sense of urgency that you have to you know, uh, treat very aggressively. Because unlike ARMD, diabetic macular edema can wait. Even if you treat late, it is not going to, you know, uh, Worsen too much, but I agree. Cataract surgery has a, has a surgery has a negative influence on the process of diabetic macular edema also. So if the cataract is not too much, and diabetic macular edema, which is center in volume diabetic macular edema, then I will try my best to make it dry without cataract surgery as far as possible. However, if the cataract is dense enough, that means the degree of cataract is much more than you can see on straight lamp or you can see on distant direct of hemoscopy that cataract is dense enough. Then my, my treatment of choice is that during the cataract surgery or, or maybe a week before I will inject Ozudrex in this patient. I am very fond user of uh, Ozudrex in such patient or even Transferon sometimes if yes. patient can't afford Ozudrex. So Ozudrex because it can last for three, four months so I, or sometimes what I've done is that cataract surgery, just prior to cataract surgery, before they make their wound, I will inject the Ozudrex. Because Ozudrex is a 22 gauge uh, injection. Yeah. So at the end of surgery, it's slightly, uh, you know, not advisable because of the problem of wound uh, issues. Uh, either you can inject one week prior or just before the start of cataract surgery on the same day, on the same day. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, to, to, to inject it the same day, uh, not, not prior to weeks or uh, one or two weeks before surgery. Yeah, because it saves time for the patient's visit actually. Yeah. You see, patient may have to travel or, you know, it's an economic issue also for the patient who comes with the relative first okay. injection. Although that is actually more desirable if uh, you, can, you can talk to the patient if he can come easily. 
so one week prior to uh, giving uh, uh, one week prior to cataract surgery you can get the injection then and then gets the cataract surgery done so yes. this is an advantage that apart from the diabetic macular edema this may help to take care of the irvine gas syndrome also yes yeah okay you prefer the the azordex uh, yeah. but, but not the anti vegf to use in such cases yeah anti vegf also can be used but uh, the issue of anti vegf is uh, you see that it lasts for maximum of 4 weeks yeah and uh, ozodex in such scenario will uh, you know last for at least 3 4 months okay. one is perfect that issue plus uh, and all anti vegf believe me are pro inflammatory Okay. There will be mild, uh, you know, inflammation because of the anti-VEGF also. Yeah, so steroids right. are anti-inflammatory, and we are doing a pro-inflammatory surgery. Yeah. Okay. It will cover both the the inflammatory reaction and the, at the same time it's anti-edematous. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yes. Th thank you very much. Well, what about the Christine? Lalit, um, generally I agree with you um, in terms of how you proceed with things. I have a patient who I saw a few days ago who is a diabetic who has had uh, panretinal photocoagulation, has received uh, Ozodex from Acrodema, and is now receiving ILEA every six weeks, and has cataracts to the point that she can't function. Uh, so the surgeon asked me if I would do bilateral cataract surgery, which I will. And I called him and I said, I want you to give this patient an injection of ILEA one week prior to my cataract surgery. and then see the patient again a week or so after I do the surgery. Now in this patient these patients I do really really careful surgery. Uh, I make sure I put them on lots of steroids and non-steroidal slow stop and give them intracranial antibiotics and I've done lots and they do fine. But I do it in conjunction with the retina surgeon and I do my part as atraumatically as possible and let him do his part or her do her part. The thing is my view of life is that you know we're going to get patients that have severe problems. that's the way it goes and no matter what we do we're not going to avoid the patient that comes to us with a severe problem i've also had one of those that was a severe steroid responder when the patient was given one of their ozodex injections their pressure went to like 45 and then they had to have glaucoma surgery so uh, i don't like to give them ozodex unless it's needed or unless i know they've had steroids before and don't respond to steroids I had another guy that had sarcoidosis and needed bilateral cataract surgery because he had dense cataracts and he was inflamed in both eyes and he couldn't see and he couldn't function. So I did both cataract surgeries and then a week later I did a trab on one eye and a week later the trab on the other eye because his pressures were like 40 from steroids. After about a few months he was fine. Uh, but those are unusual patients in whom we treat them aggressively. One of my another uh, objections to giving intravitreal steroids for uh, just to save them drops is what if they are a severe responder to steroids? Those are the ones that are more concerned with the patients in whom we know they have glaucoma. Because the patient when we know they have glaucoma, we know where they stand. It's the patients that come back to us as a surprise that make your life difficult and the patient's life difficult. And so I've had a number of patients that uh, had severe responses to steroids. and had to have urgent surgery for, uh, which is okay but i don't want to minimize those and so i only want to be giving intravitreal steroids if they actually need it uh, you see i i i do not uh, totally disagree with you that was my plan of management uh, for long long time that i will inject anti anti vegf and the reason uh, you see there's no way to find out uh, which patient is a steroid responder and which is not in clinical practice is very difficult and honestly speaking i have injected even in glaucomatous patients also steroid you see because ozodrex the rise of pressure is not as high compared to compared to tramsilinone or or flucilinone but with ozodrex is comparatively milder with respect to iop and uh, at best you see one one uh, anti glaucoma drop may be required by and large maybe uh, i'm lucky that i haven't had to face any removal of ozodrex uh, uh, any time right okay but i don't i don't disagree with your management okay thank you what about uh, kamran you have any comment about that um pretty much i you know i i will follow the retina colleagues advice and usually i will try to avoid doing cataract surgery if there's any active uh, cme so usually we'll want them to be bone dry as much as possible 
and even after they're bone dry, usually we'll, uh, I will have them get an injection, uh, uh, you know, a week or two before the surgery, uh, whether it's cataract, whether it's DSAC, DMEC, uh, any type of intraocular surgery where we're going to be um, going in. Um, and then what I will do at the time of surgery um, is, is for those patients, I will not inject into the vitreous because I feel that the retina surgeon is already dealing with the vitreous. Um, but at the time of surgery, I will give them um, either a sub, uh, subconjunctival uh, canalog injection um, underneath the eyelid so that there's additional uh, anti-inflammatory therapy that's going on. Uh, in other patients, uh, again, I don't have the numbers to, to show. This is all anecdotal. So again, I think we obviously people need to be reporting their data. Um, but other patients I've had uh, success also um, using um, oral NSAIDs uh, sort of preoperatively um, extrapolating some of the data that we'll use with um, uh, uh, um, PO steroids. So sometimes we'll give them either um, uh, prednisone uh, by mouth orally, um, starting three days before the surgery and extending uh, again one to two weeks after the surgery to augment what uh, retina is doing, uh, or also additionally giving them um, something like a, a, a PO NSAID, such as even something like ibuprofen or meloxicam uh, to, to, to further augment that. So in those situations, um, I will not go into the vitreous. Uh, I'll let the, the, the retina colleagues uh, deal with that, but I will try to support and augment uh, anti-inflammatory control with subconjunctival or PO uh, medications to, to help what they're doing in, in the back of the eye. <clears throat> okay, perfectly uh, covered and answered about the, the uh, uh, this point, but uh, let, let's state that there is no what's called combined phaco injection. It's, it's just uh, individualized for a patient with very significant cataract, actually very significant cataract, actually with uh, a, a risk of increased uh, macular edema or already present macular edema. Uh, right, especially we have um, my, my dear residents Dr. Amr Radi and Dr. Muhammad al -Basid. Dr. Amr is divided between the cataract unit and the retina unit at the same time. So yes. there's some cataract cases which be taken <laughs> to the retina only, unit. Only, only five cases. <laughs> only, five cases. <laughs> only five cases taken from the, cases. the cataract unit to the retina unit. To no, 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 no. Ah, okay. Yeah. I, I will not say. Okay. <laughs> you are already in the retina unit. <laughs> ah, okay. You are, my, you are my dear. Okay. Dr. Abbasid, uh, I think you have uh, more questions for, yes, uh, uh, Professor M. Yes. for the great speakers. Yes, uh, my first question to Dr. Lalit, uh, what about uh, the use of systemic steroid uh, in cases of post-operative endosomatis? Uh, do you prefer to use it or are you, are you against uh, it? Uh, you see, as far as intravitreal steroids are concerned... S systemic steroids. Uh, yeah, I'll come to that. Intravitreal steroids, I do not give in the first injection. Uh, I used to do that uh, around two decades back, uh, provided you can rule out fungal infection. You see, if you are 100% sure, if you do a gram stain or a KOH uh, under the microscope there and then, that means you are ruling out fungus, then uh, you could consider giving. But for majority of the patients of endothelitis where we give either intravitreal or do a vitrectomy. After 24 hours, that means after first examination, I start all of them with oral steroids. The regular dose, that is one milligram per kg, oral steroids, and also topical steroids and topical cyclovigics, apart from giving topical antibiotics. So the standard regimen of post intravitreal or post vitrectomy is to give Topical steroids, topical antibiotics, cyclophagics, and if pressures are misbehaving, then antiglucomols. Thanks. Uh, my uh, next question to Dr. Reyes. Uh, uh, do you prefer uh, or uh, what's your opinion about the prophylaxis of uh, using uh, oral or typical uh, antibiotics for surgery? Um, I, I don't give it uh, unless we know that there's active uh, trauma that is the, um, uh, that, that's happened right before the surgery. So for example, if I'm doing a, a therapeutic uh, penetrating keratoplasty for a, a perforation, for example, 
uh, we will give um, oral antibiotics. In fact, we'll also tell anesthesia to give IV um, antibiotics. And that, in, the, in, the, in both those cases, my uh, drug of choice is moxifloxacin, has been shown by our vitroretinal colleagues that it has good penetration uh, in those situations. But I will only use um, oral or IV antibiotics um, when basically when it's when I'm going into a traumatic uh, eye for routine cases, uh, obviously no. Even in patients who've had um, uh, previous, um, I've done a couple patients where that previous um, endophthalmitis in the other eye that thankfully were not on my watch. Uh, I have not given any uh, additional, um, you know. Um, you know, IV or uh, oral antib antibiotics there. But for those patients, uh, I, will, uh, I will freely admit that I've been a, a bit chicken and I will have just followed the usual standard regimen of topical antibiotics and not injected them with anything uh, uh, into the vitreous. Uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, let me to add uh, something uh, to your uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, to add uh, the ideal sign or the coronal stone uh, in the differentiation between uh, the end of salmitis and the test uh, is the vitritis. Uh, B scan or ultrasonography uh, the differentiate vitritis, uh, differentiate end of salmitis as locules of bus or loculi of bus from test because there is no sharp uh, or no cut uh, line for the inflammation or for the habobion, maybe present in test, maybe present in end of salmitis, uh, uh, the beginning of symptoms, uh, not sharply, uh, we can uh, differentiate it. Um, uh, tests may become later, uh, end of salmitis may become earlier in uh, some cases, uh, especially in cases of severe end of salmitis. Uh, habobion may be, may be present in the two conditions. Uh, I think uh, the uh, ideal or the coronary stone in differentiation uh, the test for end of salmitis is the presence or the absence of vitritis. Uh, can you agree with me? Sam, uh, voice. So, okay, uh, Dr. Bassett, thank you for your kind ad. It's perfect point, but. Uh, Actually, I have mentioned this this point in uh, my presentation about that. Do you, do you see my screen now? Yes, I, I yeah, see. Okay. The, the, I, uh, the vitreous, the vitreous yes. here in test is clear. And in endophthalmites, you will find vitreous. Sure, you, ha you have to, to find vitreous or vitreous abscess in the case of endophthalmites. But almost no vitreous or no vitreous floaters or no vitreous uh, uh, reaction in case of test. The, 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 the second slide you, I may show is the, this uh, picture on the, my left side. Uh, you will find that the test is confined and limited to the anterior chamber above, while, yes. the, while the vitrites and the, 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 the growing organism present in the case of endothermites, the same. So I agree with you about that to differentiate because of the anterior chamber, or the anterior segment picture could be similar in both tests yes, yes, and, yes. and the early endothermites. So it's very important to check for the vitrites using the ultrasonic, uh, the, the ultrasonography, as um, uh, Dr. Lalit uh, has mentioned, uh, about the clues of the ultrasonography, not in the diagnosis, but in the definition and follow up of the vitreous of the endothermites to, uh, to go for vitrectomy or, or not. Thank you, Dr. Abbas. Do you have another question? Uh, one question, but uh, I'll uh, give the chance for my colleague, Amr Rad. Dr. Amr, uh, we didn't hear your voice today, Dr. Amr. Sorry, Dr. Muhammad, uh, ask all, the, all questions I'd like to ask uh, Muhammad. You have the same, you have uh, the, both have the same paper? But, but, but I, I'd like to ask uh, my professor, Dr. Arshinov, about the preoperative antibiotics. Uh, Dr. Arshinov said that um, uh, routine preoperative uh, antibiotic uh, antibiotic uh, is, is not mandatory, but in our department, we routinely give uh, preoperative antibiotic, especially uh, one day uh, preoperative, uh, because we uh, depend on uh, conjunctival as well. We have some patients uh, with uh, no clinical manifestations of infection, but positive conjunctival as well. So we routinely give uh, preoperative antibiotics, especially uh, one day uh, preoperative. Uh, what's your recommendation about uh, this uh, this matter? The conjunctiva mm -hmm. tends to have a very uh, burden of bacteria. 
when you give preoperative topical antibiotics, for example, what you do is you kill off all of the sensitive bacteria and you leave the nutrients to act as a growth medium for resistant bacteria. You don't encourage resistance because mutation is random. But if in the, in the environment, let's say in a hospital where you have lots of resistant bacteria rolling around, the patient may get infected with a resistant bacterium. If the patient's infected with a resistant bacterium, their risk of coming out badly after surgery is much, much higher than if you just left them alone. The bacteria replication cycle for most bacteria we're concerned with in ophthalmology is about a half an hour. So if you bring in the patient into your operating room one hour before surgery and you give them, let's say, topical Vigamox three or four times, you've killed off all the sensitive bacteria. If there perchance there was a resistant one around, you won't kill that one off. But the chances of a person walking in from outside somewhere, let's say, coming from northern Canada to me, carrying a resistant bacterium to moxifloxacin is extremely low. But if I bring in my office and I give them topical moxifloxacin and they walk around Toronto for a week, their chance of getting a resistant bacterium is probably a thousand times higher. So I think it's really uh, a silly thing to do. You, you increase your risk. Just give them a lot preoperatively and give them, put betadine drops in and prep their face well with betadine. And that will give you the best chance of getting a sterile operative environment. Dr. Amar, uh, uh, in any case, you see, whenever we prepare the, uh, we also do not give any intra, uh, this uh, preoperative topical antibiotics at all. I think uh, somebody can do a financial calculation as Dr. Cameron had done, how much a billion dollars you can use by giving preoperative antibiotics for a few days because uh, it's a sheer wastage of uh, effort as well as uh, money because you see with the preparation, you put betadine at least two times uh, just before starting surgery. Betadine is bactericidal or viricidal or fungicidal for the majority of the organism. And betadine is, I think, standard of care everywhere. So therefore, I think we depend on betadine preoperatively more than preoperative antibiotics. Preoperatively, we just just during the just during the uh, you know just when you are preparing the patient for surgery. Yeah, but I mean, our patients are getting antibiotics anyway, so we take their Vigamox bottle and give them a drop three times before surgery, and then give them beta D. Yeah, but not 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 few days before surgery. No, not yeah. two days. We start an hour at the most before. Yeah, it's just a good thing for the pharmaceutical companies, but not for uh, for us. Actually, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, yeah, and, and not for <laughs> not for the patient himself. But actually, I I, I have to uh, uh, I, I let me say that I agree for that uh, uh, because uh, if if I take a swab conjunctival swab from the conjunctival fornices of uh, almost nine percent of patients will be will be positive for uh, a bacteria. Whatever the kind, if it's uh, subclinical, if it's weak, if it's flora. So uh, we, we have to set the preoperative treatment just for the obvious clinical infections. If there is mucopatia in the contractivites, if there is bacterial blepharitis, you have to check for the anterior segment infections first. If it's obvious, you can treat. If not obvious and clinical with clinical signs, uh, uh, you, you have to just take the, 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 the measures of the of the intraoperative uh, clean, cleansing of the anterior segment of the ocular surface, like the povidine iodine, uh, the dilated one to, to wash the, anterior, the ocular surface with it before starting your surgery, and keeping the trial environment and in instrumentations. Right? Do you agree with me about that? I would wish a similar study to be done as Dr. Cameron, because I am very fascinated by this slide. How many billion dollars uh, wasted? I think uh, if uh, you one bottle of uh, say any antibiotic we use by all cataract surgeons, all all patients, how many similar billion dollars I think will come? If you buy them in the U.S., it's even more billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really, really. It's uh, it is. Um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, another question, Sam. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lali Berma, I'd like to ask um, about the intravitreal injection of, uh, of antifungals. 
uh, either either intravitreal injection alone uh, or either uh, after uh, doing vitrectomy uh, for endosomitis. Um, is it enrolled for antifungal, especially if the if the condition is very severe uh, for the patient or the patient immunocompromised uh, or have um, comorbidities? Yeah. Fungal and <laughs> fungal enteritis is a big challenge. You see, the response uh, uh, to to candida and all is very good, but the response to aspergillus uh, niger or aspergillus is not as great. Even if you do a radical vitrectomy, remove the IUL, then also at least uh, you know one third of these patients require multiple vitrectomies, and sometimes require twice a week, uh, you know, uh, amphetericin B also sometimes. You see, sometimes the voriconazole, we start with voriconazole, intravitreal voriconazole initially. There may be few patients who will respond. But by and large, on statistical point of view, majority of the proven fungal require multiple vitrectomies. And, uh, and, and a lot of these patients are aspergillus, they require repeated injections of amphotericin B, apart from voriconazole. Perfect. Uh, the last question, Dr. Hassan. Yes. Dr. Reyes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Reyes, uh, we had uh, some cases of uh, uveitis as intermediate uveitis, especially intermediate uveitis, some cases. Uh, in intermediate uveitis, uh, the vitreous is a major site of inflammation. You, you mean and, after uh, surgery, uh, Mohammed? No, 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 no. Yeah, without Pre surgery, without surgery. Pre uh, yes, yes, pre yeah, yeah. And the patient uh, had a complicated uh, cataract, significant cataract, uh, as Dr. Sakafa cataract central. Uh, by examination, the patient has intermediate uveitis and severe. Uh, following up this patient with systemic uh, anti-inflammatory as steroid or systemic immunosuppressive, and uh, we referred uh, a lot of them to, inter uh, to internal medicine, and they give him immunosuppressive drugs but with following up by examination or by B scan, there is minimal response. There is minimal response. Uh, and we stay with, uh, with, uh, with uh, this cases uh, more than three months. Uh, but no response uh, or minimal response to this uh, treatment. What will you do? Uh, uh, we are going for cataract surgery with special precautions or still to be the patient completely normal and I think uh, once the vitreous is, uh, has severe vitreitis, I think uh, improvement is uh, uh, very slow and the uh, absorption to this, uh, the absorption or improvement to do this uh, materials in the vitreous, I think uh, me, me... The penetration, no you, mean the, uh, you mean the penetration? No no. Yes, yeah. yes, no response at all because the, the penetration, slow penetration of the drugs or anything uh, other that, uh, what will you do or the precaution to do with this uh, patient if uh, yeah. uh, you get the, the decision for to do cataract surgery for him? Yeah, uh, so great question and something that, you know, comes up, um, you know, often, you know, as, as uh, being in an academic center, we get these sorts of patients that are referred over quite frequently for that because the guys in the community don't want to deal with them. Um, so first of all, you know, we need to figure out why does this patient have um, uveitis? And so a lot of times there is an underlying etiology that needs to be worked up. So these patients, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll have our uveitis specialist uh, do a, a thorough lab uh, workup looking for, um, you know, the common culprits, sarcoid, syphilis, TB, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, Lyme disease and these sorts of things that have now also recently been brought to the forefront. Um, I have actually had... Um, a patient recently that we um, couldn't figure out why they had intermediate uveitis. We then said for a UPEP and SPEP for serum protein electrophoresis, find this patient actually had multiple myeloma, so cannot forget about causes of cancer, which may need to be treated and worked up prior to, uh, to surgery. So my first uh, thing is really to figure out why does somebody have uveitis, because a good uveitis specialist in conjunction with the rheumatologist can usually figure out why they have uh, uveitis. So even though I, I'm a cornea, and uh, a specialist, I, I don't claim to have a uh, even a minor degree in uveitis, so so I will make sure that uh, somebody works them up. So that's the first case. Figure out why do they have the uveitis. Uh, number two, many times if they have systemic inflammation, um, the good old uh, um, oral steroids or IV steroids may not be sufficient. They may need to be put on biological agents, the Humira's, Embrils, 
uh, of the world. Uh, it, uh, here in the United States, it seems that every every month there's a new uh, disease modifying drug that's being uh, come out there. So I usually rely on the rheumatologist um, to to manage that. So. The, the key here is to make sure that they are as quiet as possible because again, cataract surgery, unless it's a phacomorphic type of picture, is usually not uh, vision threatening. And even uh, after they've been sufficiently treated, I want them to be quiet for at least three months. So we will examine them you know, periodically to make sure they've been uh, quiet. And then perioperatively, we'll kind of talk to their um, a treating uh, either uveitis or rheumatologist specialist to either bump up the uh, systemic uh, treatment um, with either additional infusion therapy or oral uh, um, uh, disease modifying therapy. And I'll usually put them on oral uh, prednisone, I find uh, 40 milligrams uh, to 60 milligrams, depending on male, female, or um, body um, uh, weight, starting one week before the surgery, uh, and then keeping them on the 40 milligrams, extending to at least two weeks after the surgery, and then tapering by 10 milligrams per week for a total of about one month after surgery. So they've basically, they, they would have started oral steroids one week prior to surgery and then continued a taper up to six weeks after surgery so that these eyes can stay quiet. And if they have bilateral cataracts, I will usually uh, wait for a good another three months after the first eye before even considering the second eye. So these are not the patients you want to do the same day or even a week or two weeks after uh, because they can be very pro-inflammatory uh, uh, you know, uh, types of eyes. So um, these are eyes that I will inject into the vitreous, especially if they have not been injected uh, before, uh, but I will definitely supplement with uh, topical uh, steroid and non-steroid. These are the patients that would fall into the severe category that I described in the, in the proposed algorithm. So those are some of the strategies that, that we follow. And, um, you know, certainly other providers may have different strategies that they find successful, but this has worked for us uh, thus far. What about uh, doing a slight uh, barzablana vitrectomy uh, after cataract surgery, doing the same session to this patient, especially if he has uh, um, uh, density material in the vitreous? You're saying if, if they have vitreous? So, so normally I, I would have hoped that my um, uveitis or retina colleague has, has treated that before. Um, I don't do pars plana vitrectomy. I know some anterior segment surgeons do, um, but uh, so I can't comment on that. Um, I, but have I ever... I mean, I've never acted uh, actively um, operated on an eye with active vitritis. So I don't know if uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Arshinov or Dr. Verma have uh, for cataract surgery, but for me, that's a no-go to, to operate on anybody with active uh, vitritis. So I can't comment on whether doing a parts plane of vitrectomy either concurrently or immediately after the cataract surgery uh, or even before the cataract surgery would be beneficial. Um, but usually by the time I operate on them, I, I want their eyes to be as quiet as possible. Thank yeah, you. okay, okay. We, we, may, we may take the, the answer from Dr. Arshinov and Dr. Lalit about this question. Uh, you see, I agree with the, what uh, Dr. Cameron says. By and large, we also follow the same principles that all these uh, surgeries have to be done under steroid cover. And uh, I also follow the same regimen that you start preoperatively and continue for six to eight weeks after the surgery uh, steroids and we give slightly higher dose, maybe one milligram per kg, maybe 60 to 80 milligram. And at the end of surgery, on the operation table itself, I inject uh, two cc of uh, decadron intravenously to these patients also, in addition to what uh, Dr. Cameron said. But in case I'm pretty sure that this is a non-infectious uh, uveitis and vitreous is involved, I also am a strong proponent of Ozodrex in such patients. Yeah, okay, but you, you will inject Ozodrex, but, but you, so can, you see, uh, because uh, Dr. Cameron is scared by talking about syphilis and Lyme and other diseases, which are contraindications, but if I'm sure it's a non-infectious pathology, uh, because the vertical follow-up of the patient will tell you, or a good uh, uveitis and rheumatology workup will tell you that it's a most probably non-infectious uveitis. But believe me, if it is non-infectious uveitis, Ozodrex in such situation, apart from intravenous 2cc decadron, cycloplegics, and, and what uh, Dr. Cameron said, that a long-term steroid tapering doses, uh, I think uh, Ozodrex is a, was a wonderful drug in such patients. Uh, Dr. Lalit, uh, uh, most cases of anterior uveitis uh, show improvement with, uh, with the systemic immunosuppressive or systemic steroid, but I comment on patient with intermediate uveitis. 
وذ بيت رايت 6 مانسز وذ استرويد اور امينو سبريسف بات نو امبروفمنت ات اول اور مينيمال ريسبونس بيكوز سيك ماتيريالز فيري لارج سيك ماتيريالز ان ذا فيتريس شو نو ابزوربشن اي ثينك فيتريكتومي فور ذس لارج ماتيريال سو ان ساتش بيشنتس اي ويل بريبير فور فيتريكتومي اند باي ان لارج ذيز ار نوت ديفيكلت فيتريكتومي شو دو ان ساتش بيشنت وير ذا ثيك ماتيريال ان ذا فيتريس كافيتي يو سي ارلي فيتريكتومي is mandated and if the if the pulmonary condition permits we may do a combined surgery also this all depends on how how uh, good pupil is and at end of and the end of a good cataract surgery it's wise to do a in their in their horoscopy at that time if the glow is very good you can see details you wait for some time if however it's obstruction glow no harm in doing with treatment because it's not a difficult job at that time very thank you very thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Amr. Do you have uh, another questions? Dr. Amr Radi, I think he's not there. Dr. Lalit, I, uh, uh, the time in New Delhi now is 2, uh, 2 a.m., uh, beyond 2 a.m., <laughs> okay. I, I, know, I know it's so late, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of, of, of being um, uh, tired and, uh, and you may want to, to go to sleep. Okay, you are free now if you want to uh, leave. Otherwise, you are so welcome to complete uh, the, the, coming, the, the, the remaining questions with us. Okay, uh, let, let me to ask Dr. Archinov about the Vigamax eye drops. You showed in your presentation the preparation of the intracameral Vigamax injection mm -hmm. from the Vigamax eye drop itself. This Vigamax eye drop with preservative or not? No, Vigamox is non-preserved. Actually, the nice thing about Vigamox is the only eye drop, well, in all the moxifloxacins uh, that was ever discovered or used, where if you leave the bottle out for a week, nothing will grow on the rim. It, Vigamox is self-preserved. It has no preservative, and so that's why it's safe to use in the eye. Uh, it's the only one that's safe to use in the eye. The generics, it depends upon what you have in your country and if anyone's checked it and shown that it's safe to use. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I don't think we have a preservative-free Vigamox in uh, in Egypt. So, really? so I thought all the ones I know that are sold everywhere are preservative-free. Okay, no, there there is no Vigamox preservative-free uh, up to up to my uh, to my knowledge. But um, uh, the last time when when I was doing the FACO surgery, two months or three months ago, because the surgery now is a memory for us after <laughs> after. <laughs> I find that the assistant at the end of the operation give give she gave me the syringe with the intracameral Vigamox. I asked it, it's preserved to free. She was not sure about that, so I didn't get inside. But I checked about uh, uh, after 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 that. I found that the Vigamox eye drops with preservative, but they depend on the dilution of the preservative. With the, with, the, with the dilution of the uh, generic itself, it will be with less, much less effect on the coronal endothelium and uh, the intraocular tissues. What is your opinion? Do you agree? If you use Vigamox itself, it's not preserved. If you use a generic, I don't know what you get. But the Alcon Vigamox is not preserved. The Vigamox eye drops we have. Yeah, the, the eye drop from Alcon is it's, not preserved. It's, it's, it's preservative free. It's preservative free. Yeah, if, even if we if we are using the bottle, the the the, the normal bottle here, which uh, which could be um, saved in the in the room temperature, uh, not in the. But I don't know what the normal bottle there is. Do you use Alcons or do you use a generic? Yeah. Okay. If you use a generic, I don't know what they have in Egyptian generics. Not not <laughs> nothing. <laughs> but they're generics. If you use, if you, if you use generic. You will. You are likely to produce a picture of us. Right. Yeah. That's the risk. Okay. You know any information about that, Amr? Sir, uh, I would like to uh, ask about the, uh, about another thing, uh, which yeah. is the intra intracameral injection of uh, dexamethasone. I I have seen uh, some surgeons yeah. uh, do uh, a surgery uh, injection of intra intracameral injection of dexamethasone. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, this uh, this method? The dexamethasone injection. Dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Intracamera. I, 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 I have never done, but I will let Dr. Archinov to answer about that. 
I see no reason to do it. Frankly, you know, if you give the patient topical drops and don't do traumatic surgery, there's no reason to give intracameral dexamethasone. Okay, so, but, but so, uh, yes. uh, you know, you're going to blur the patient's vision, and why bother? The dexamethasone, dexamethasone, not not triamcinolone. The dexamethasone is clear, but even so, I see no reason to give it. Okay. I, I have seen I have seen some surgeons uh, do this, uh, so I ask uh, ask about this. Uh, but I don't I don't know I don't know uh, the concentration of uh, the concentration of uh, dilution with this dexamethasone, but I have seen uh, some surgeon uh, do intracameral injection of dexamethasone at the end of the surgery, and he uh, he said that um, uh, this decreases postoperative inflammation uh, mostly. What I what I told you <laughs> in my last uh, ten and twelve thousand eyes. In treating patients the way I do, and giving them the topical drops, intracameral Pigamox, I see really zero inflammation on day one. They come in and their their anterior chamber is clear. So why would I give them intracameral dexamethasone? <coughs> yes, the same. I yeah. Add to that. I just wanted to add to that. I mean, I, I you know, uh, I hear a lot of people say that this is what I do. This is my practice. I mean, I commend mm -hmm. Dr. Arshinov for actually tracking his data and his outcomes. And I would say to those who, who do the dexamethasone, for example, I mean, publish your data. I mean, that's the problem. As you go to these meetings, everyone says, oh, this is what I do. And I've had no problems this many years. But nobody actually publishes their, their data and their results. And, you know, you know, I've published here my data. I'm sharing the shortcomings. I'm sharing here's the stuff that we need to do. Dr. Arshinov shared his results and how his technique has evolved over the years. Yes. And that's my response to those who do dex is, if it works, I mean, show us it works, you know, show us where it needs to be improved on. And so this is, I think, I mean, you guys are residents and I'm a young academic, is this is my problem is by stuff that you read in, in on internet forums or listservs or even at these conferences, these guys that get up there or gals that get up there and, you know, talk from the podium until you show your data and we talk about evidence-based medicine I mean, with due respect, like, please sit down, like, don't talk about it unless you can back it up and, and show your limitations. And I mean, that's the problem is everybody share, cherry picks their data and wants to just show, oh, this is, this is what works and this is my anecdotal thing. And if, if we were a, a community and profession that went by anecdotal evidence or only cherry picking our best cases, we will not advance our field forward. So I think we have to not only show our data, but show the limitations of our data, show where the additional work needs to be done, because that's how we move forward and try to truly bring forward breakthrough uh, technologies and innovations. And the road to innovation and advancement in ophthalmology is never one that's an elevator. It's, it's I would say, it's a, it's a stepwise pyramid where there are, you know, uh, moments of plateau or even decline, but eventually you want to try to uh, you know, show progress. So same thing with dexamethasone. It may work, but I don't, I haven't seen any data to show that it does. So I would say those who do it, please publish and share with us and enlighten us. Yes. Very, very nicely said. I think uh, uh, they, whosoever is giving, ask him to have two control arms. Uh, you see one patient being, one set of patient being given dexa, other not being given dexa, and let them have uh, either an OCT or AC, AC, AC cell flare meter so that some objective evidence is there. Yeah, I and mean, that's why in our study, we, we, we had a control group of another thousand eyes that had, you know, that had the topical regimen. So that's why we're able to actually now make that uh, statement. And so I think those who want to you know, um, make definitive statements on it, the, the research and the work ha have to be done. I mean, and Dr. Arshinov has done this for years and years, and that's kind of you know, you know, hundreds or even thousands of, of man hours that just, uh, you know, lead to those now conclusions. So uh, others have to be able to do that work rather than just say, oh, this is what works in my practice or yes. this is what I've seen. Yes, 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 my dear. Okay, everything could work and, every, and, and uh, everything couldn't work. The, the, the value here or the, the, the fact here is the study and the data, the collected data, not the individual practice, which, uh, which could be, could be wor working uh, in, in with with one with one case with one situation and couldn't be with the other, so we have to call to report. If you, you permit, me, if you permit, may I leave because tomorrow is a working day for me. 
<laughs> okay, uh, really, yeah. we 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 yeah. uh, really were honored. Uh, we really enjoyed this uh, conversation. We are we're, we're enjoying. Uh, let, let, let me asking ask you the last question before leaving. Yeah. In 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 every case of a trichotomy for endophthalmites, we have to remove the IL and the bag. No, no. Only in uh, very severe uh, endophthalmitis where you are not able to achieve your objective. It's not, uh, you see, IUL is an optical device. There's yeah. no point, uh, you know, uh, preserving an IUL for the sake of infection. If I am not able to achieve my objective, that means I can't get rid of all the infectious materials, then I don't hesitate to remove. Because, you see, IUL can be put later on as a secondary after six months or one year also. Yeah. But first yeah. aim is to clear the infection, save the eye, have, uh, you see, good vision, if possible, for a couple of months and maybe more than a year, and then think of optical rehabilitation. Okay, thank you. It's not a step in the vitrectomy for endothelitis. No, no, no. if, if you feel that there's a colonies of the infection of the organism inside the bag, or there's patches in the bag. Yeah, so even in P. acne, where uh, uh, the colonies are in the bag, I try to inject uh, Benko in the bag. Yeah. You see, first step is it's a step ladder kind of approach. First step is to inject uh, Benko in the bag. Believe me, around 20 30 patients of P. acne will respond to this. If not, do a lens sparing kind of treatment, do a capsulectomy, partial capsulectomy. Access to, into, the, into the bag area. If that does not work, then only uh, remove the IV. Okay, do you, do you check the, the periphery of the retina, the oris errata and the retina periphery with indentation? Yes, for all patients. That's a must. Because that, no vitreous surgeon will say that uh, without that, I come out of the vitreous cavity. Yeah. That's a 100% yes. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Larit Verma, the vitreous surgeon and consultant in the Center for Sorry, Sorry because uh, tomorrow is a working day for me. So oh. before I thought, before I fall okay. asleep here, Okay, thank you. Thank you for your thank participation you. and for your time. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see, see you again. Really, really enjoyed. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye. Muhammad. Bye bye. Good night. Really enjoyed. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <clears throat> Let's go to Dr. Archinov about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, you bought you bought non-steroidal in your prescription postoperatively. This is for the inflammation of the anterior segment or just for prophylaxis against the CME? Well, non-steroidals have a synergistic effect with uh, steroids. And so if you give both, then they uh, have less inflammation. And so I see no reason not to give both. Some people will try to give only one or the other. I have patients that are steroid responders, I give only non-steroidals. I may give them steroids for, let's say, two days before their pressure goes up and then stop the steroids and give them non-steroidals. But there's been enough evidence everywhere to show that taking non-steroidals for about a month post-op really reduces the risk of CME. And so yeah. why not? Yes, thank you. But, but you can bought them just uh, as anti-inflammatory. Uh, did you try in a patient to, to give him non-steroidal without steroid? Yes, but it takes them longer to get better. I, I, I believe in hitting the patients hard in the beginning. I, I do bilateral surgery mostly. Yeah. And I want them to see 2020 the next day. I don't want their eyes inflamed. I don't want them any problems. If you give them six times a day of both, by the time they come back the next morning, they're fine. And they, okay. they see well and their eyes okay. Uh, nothing, if you OCT, the macula is flat and they're, they're just okay. Hey, perfect. Much easier. Thank, thank you. What about the dexamethasone? But not intracameral, uh, because there is no reports about that. I mean, dexamethasone instead of the prednisolone as a steroid in eye drops postoperatively. Uh, did you check for the heavy reports about the H1? Is it powerful like prednisolone or is it uh, weaker? Well, as far as I know, it's close to being as potent. But uh, the other one is more common in Canada. There are a whole bunch of generics, so they're very cheap. Uh, and so the government pays for them. And so the, if I try to give the patient something else, they're gonna fight with me. So I, I use prednisolone. Okay, it's not different yet. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Cameron. 
if I can just add to that. Like, so, you know, so Imprimis came up with um, uh, a formulation that was available here called, they call it DMK or Dex Moxie Ketorolac. Uh, they released it, I don't know, sometime in 2017 or 2018. You know, I used it for about 25 cases um, in lieu of our trimcinol Moxie injection. And I suspect there's some work to be done because I gave up on it after those 25 cases because they, we had really a, a very unreasonably high rate of um, inflammation, uh, both persistent inflammation, rebound inflammation. Out of those 25 cases, we had two cases of CME. And so I, I just didn't think I was attracted by the Ketorolac addition to the, um, to the injectable. And that's why I was uh, you know, excited about it. In fact, I even emailed uh, Dr. Lindstrom, uh, who's you know, advisor for uh, imprimis about this, and they they said they admitted that they need to work on the the formulation because it just was not effective. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, in again, my limited experience with Dex as an injectable, uh, I don't think that Dex is is uh, dexamethasone is is strong enough, and so I've not used it topically. I know in other parts of the world uh, it has been used uh, very effectively, but I'm only commenting on its usefulness as an injectable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir, yes. I'd like uh, to ask about uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, uh, post operatively in patients with um, uh, diabetes, but no diabetic macular edema and no, um, no, no complications uh, regarding uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, but uh, the patient had long di duration of diabetes. Uh, and I'd like to prophylax, uh, to give the non steroidal for prophylaxis against the development of uh, post operative macular edema. Uh, so I ask, uh, ask about uh, the dose and duration uh, of non steroidal anti-inflammatory after uh, after cataract surgery. Yeah, okay, it's, it's very good. It's a very good question. It's rising from the the the, the previous question about that. If if mm -hmm. Dr. Achinov gives the non steroidal for the protection against the macular edema, or to enhance the anti-inflammatory effect in the anterior segment. Um, how many times during the, uh, and, during and Dr. Dr. Archinov said uh, that for both, right? Right. For both, yes. Yeah, for and both. The, the pre-med study shows that for you should give it for a month. <laughs> for and a month. For a month is probably okay, but the problem is, it may be better for longer, but you don't know because no one studied that. Yeah. Okay. They only studied for a month. I, I, I ask Dr. I, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Before Abdul uh, Basit uh, yes. giving your question, let me to complete. Uh, I'm, I used to give the patient, the, the diabetic patient, non steroidal for one month, twice per day, uh, mm. uh, twice, per, twice per day for one month, if there is no macular edema. But if this patient with uh, uncontrolled diabetes uh, for, for a long time before surgery, okay, we, we have controlled the diabetes in the, the in short weeks or the previous weeks of the surgery, but still having the possibility of getting the, the, the post-operative macular edema. So I may increase the dose for three times per day and for longer duration, up to two or three months, according with the follow-up of the patient. You, 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 you have to follow this patient uh, for two uh, points. The post-operative care, and at the same time, check the macular. If, if, you, if you suspect any macular changes, the macular edema, ask for OCT. If there is any disruption or any changes, co complete the, the non steroidal anti with higher dose for a longer time and with uh, at, the same, at the same time the restrict control of the blood sugar. I, I think so. You, you agree with me, uh, Kamran? Yeah, my, you know, my, my current practice um, now is that you know, even though we're injecting people with triamcinol and moxifloxacin, is that um, you know every you know, we basically stratified patients into the groups that we're studying, but most patients we're finding have some type of risk factor that puts them into the the moderate. It's it's harder to find the low risk patients. So especially um, with diabetes, everybody gets a non steroidal. My preferred non steroidal choice is Prolenza, uh, which is Bromfenac, which is available in once daily dosing. I just find it's easier for patients to remember to take a drops once a day. However, again, we live in the wonderful United States of America where insurance uh, uh, you know, can, can play a role. And so Ketorolac is the other uh, medication that we use, which is available generic. And we dose that for patients who fall into that moderate risk for uh, uh, three times a day for four to six weeks. Really, I just tell them to take it until the bottle finishes. So uh, for at least one month and many patients take them 
uh, after six weeks. I will say that the diabetics do represent a very unique type of additional cystoid macular edema because it's been shown that some of them can develop uh, cystoid macular edema even up to six weeks after. So I do think the, the one month is the bare minimum of the non-steroidals. And if somebody has kind of severe diabetic retinopathy, they've already received PRP, they're receiving injections, I will even push that out to six weeks of uh, non-steroidal. So sometimes they even would have finished their supplemental topical uh, steroid drop, but I will have them use their non-steroidal even up to six weeks of extrapolating uh, some of the data that have been shown with the um, diabetic uh, cystoid macular edema. <coughs> yeah, perfect. So, yes, yes, yes. I, talk, I, I want to give Kamran a chance to criticize me like I criticized him before. So, <laughs> so let me tell you some things that are... Never, I, never. I would never do that. Well, you can go ahead. It's a good game. Um, this is sort of anecdotal, but I'll tell you my past history because you're all too young to know my past history. It turns out that when I initially trained, my training was in metabolic and hair diseases. And in my uh, third week as a resident, I discovered the cause of gyrate atrophy. And I went around the world and gave talks on this and various things. It was the first um, inborn era of metabolism in ophthalmology. Uh, and this was because my family were all in molecular biology. My aunt was chair of biochemistry. My sister was doing molecular biology in California and whatever. So I was told I better study biochemistry or else they're going to kill me. So I did. So what I found out was I began to get all these patients to do cataract surgery on who had retinitis pigmentosa because that also wasn't well worked out then. And the gyre atrophy patients and a whole bunch of other people that had retinal degeneration. And I very rapidly figured out that the reason that they lose the last few degrees of their vision is not because of the disease. They lose it from cystic macroedema. And, then I, and in many, many of these diseases get cataracts as part of the disease. And they get cataracts when they're like 42 or 45 years old, not 60 or 70. So they were being sent to me to, uh, to do their cataracts. And I began to give them uh, the, the ketorolog. This is in the early 80s or mid 80s, uh, before anyone was using non-steroidals, because I found out that if I gave them ketorolog topically, that they didn't get CME. And so I had patients that I've had I still have patients that have been on topical ketorolac for like 30 years. And I find that they maintain vision of like 20, 30 in their two degree island of vision, and they can actually function quite well by scanning. And so I have no uh, concern if I get a diabetic that was sent because of concerns of diabetic macroedema to put them on topical ketorolac or napafenac and leave them on it for years mm. because I, it, yes. it helps. It gets rid of the macroedema and, and you know, it's not, you're not going to get large studies on people that have RP and had cataract surgery because there aren't that many people who were in a position to do a good enough study to look and see that they weren't getting worse from the RP, they're getting worse only from the macroedema because when you have a four degree visual field and you have atrophy of your photoreceptors, it's kind of tricky to figure out what made the last little bit go. But I have probably 20 of them that I've studied in great detail, doing endless pictures and fluorescenes and this and that, and we've studied them. And I'm convinced that they get better when you give them non -steroidals. So I was using non in every cataract patient since 1990. And I began to give it to people that had, had retinal degenerations probably before that, about five years before. And now anyone who has macroedema for retinal degeneration diabetics, anybody. I just leave them on non -steroidals. And I have patients who take uh, Acular post-op, let's say once or twice a day for five and 10 years and mm. fine. <clears throat> yes. So uh, I, 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 I can say, say about that, you know, um, I, I agree with you. I, I certainly do, you know, do think topical meds have a role. Now I, I can say that uh, there's many cornea specialists, including those that I train under, that to this day refuse to use topical non -steroidals because of you know, reports of car, uh, corneal toxicity yeah. that have been report with, reported with things like, um, you know, and it's thought to be probably due to the preservative that was there uh, in Acular. It's not been you know, reported with other uh, uh, non-steroidals. Can I comment on that? Yeah, sure. Actually, it was reported. And it was reported from Voltaren that was made Voltaren, by yes. the ethical company. It was another company. I apologize. It had yes. a terrible preservative and they got corneal perforations that has yeah. not been reported with Ketorolac or any of the others. And so I'm very cautious in giving patients Voltaren because I'm afraid they're gonna get a generic, but I, I'm not concerned by giving them Ketorolac. It stings a little more, but doesn't bother them. 
and I really yeah. have patients on for more than 10 years and they're okay. Yeah, okay, I, 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 I know more. I know yeah, more. I only mentioned that just as a, as a uh, as what the, just to give, give an insight into the world of the cornea <laughs> surgeons uh, and what some of them uh, believe about the, the topical non-steroidals. And in fact, and in some of the cornea listservs, um, when those of us who do use topical non-steroidals, especially, especially some of the senior cornea specialists um, will ballyhoo us and, and kind of condemn us for using uh, topical non-steroidals. So I think uh, it, it's, it's just, it's interesting and funny uh, which group of people you talk to, whether it's cataract surgeons or cornea specialists, and as someone who tries to uh, traverse both worlds, uh, you're often both praised and condemned by, by both people. So well, I'll tell you a story because you're young. Okay. I was the first in the world to do uh, corneal refractive surgery. And in the early 1990s, I wrote a few papers on how giving topical ketorolac uh, really abated the pain and made them do much better and stopped inflammation. Mm -hmm. And there was another uh, issue that they got uh, subepithelial infiltrates, which were, uh, occur because if you give only a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, the position it blocks in the arachidonic acid pathway is down the road and it allows them to recruit white cells and they get non, they get sub uh, epithelial infiltrates. So we had, had then an agreement among those of us who were doing coronal refractive surgery in about 1993, which was no Americans because they weren't allowed to, um, that we would only give topical non-steroidals with topical steroids. And so the rule is that if you have uh, any epithelial defect in the cornea, you never give non-steroidals alone. You only give it with steroids. And the issue in the mid 90s was not Ketorolac or any other drug. It was all with that Voltaren. It was one generic Voltaren that caused all the corneal perforation. But even so, we're still careful never to give yeah. topical steroidals in a non-healed cornea. And I still get patients referred to the emergency room with a corneal abrasion where the doc in the emergency room gave the guy a bottle of Ketorolac to take mm -hmm. three or four times to get rid of the pain, but they might perforate. So I tell them, forget it, throw away the bottle and I'll patch their eye for a day so it heals because I don't want them to take that. Okay, thank you for, um, the, for, the, for the, the fully detailed answer about the non steroidal use in case of cataract Dr. surgery. Sam? Yes, Abdul was, yeah. Uh, last question to Dr. Uh, Steve. Uh, can we use uh, antibiotic uh, and the anti-inflammatory as a combination post-operative? Uh, I mean, we have many products in, uh, in our markets as a combination in the same bottle, not uh, as in separate bottle as the uh, fluoroquinolones and the dexamethasones in the same bottle, not a separate uh, bottle each us. Yes, I, so the answer to that is I don't know. And the reason is Canada decided about 15 years ago not to sell combination drugs. So they don't have them here. Uh, except I think Torbordex is still around because it predated the regulation. So those who were grandfathered in can still be sold. I think Torbrex is the only one sold in Canada with the combination steroid antibiotic, but none of the others are. So I actually have no idea what you have in Egypt and whether it's safe or not. There's so many uh, ophthalmologists give uh, combination astobromycin and dexamethasone. We, we talked about this point now. Mm. The dexamethasone as, a, as yeah. a, an alternative to the prednisolone. Okay, mm. okay, it's, uh, uh, it's working, but, but uh, let's... Uh, but let me say that I, I, I had many patients who misunderstand my instructions. I told the patient to start medication a few hours after the surgery when, the, when he, came, when he uh, went back to the, the, his home, okay? Uh, to remove the eye patch and start the medication up till the, 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 the hour 12 midnight and then start again from the next morning. The, the patient misunderstood me and, uh, and, and, and uh, put the eye drops just for the first day. And this, this, patient, this patient was from a far, far area from my clinic. So the, she, they came to my clinic again after three days. And I was following them by phone. After three days, without treatment completely for two days. And the, the patients were... Uh, quiet with quiet eyes. So you may, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. But I, I, I mean that if you, if you, if you get the dexamethasone, it will work. But the, the, the much better one is the prednisolone, and the, the drug of choice is the prednisolone as topical treatment. 
even if you didn't give just entry, you, you didn't give both of them, it may pass, but it may not pass. So, so the recommended one, the prednisolone, and I am on now. I just, I, I'm, I'm giving my patient prednisolone frequently and uh, the uh, moxifloxacin. Just, there is no systemic hydro, uh, antibiotic, there is no systemic anti-inflammatory, there is no eye ions after the, the surgery and the results, uh, thanking Allah, is, are very well. Uh, I, I think you are tired. We have a lot of- Let me of tell you one academic pearl. Okay, yeah. when you mentioned Turbodex, so I don't use Turbodex at all, even though it's the accommodation available in Canada after surgery. And the reason is, first, the penetration of Turbomycin into the eye is terrible compared to uh, Vigamox. Okay, yeah. So I also want the patient to only receive one drug because uh, moxifloxacin is the most broad spectrum agent we have, and in the concentration we give it, I showed you the graphs where it kills everything except for the occasional resistant strain. If you are unlucky enough to get one of those resistant strains, that bacterium is always going to be saphipidermidus or saphorus, but usually epidermidus. And it's almost always exquisitely sensitive to tobramycin or any of the drugs we use to treat endophthalmitis. And the reason is the moxifloxacin drug works on DNA. The other ones are all cell wall inhibitors. And so you're taking a bacterium and treating it with an antibiotic that works by a totally different mechanism. And so if you have a patient, say, with a corneal ulcer, if you give them uh, a topical Vigamox and topical Tobramycin, it'll probably get better because you're covering everything from two different angles. I don't recommend doing that. We're going to get into four to five drops and the whole thing. But, you know, one of the things I do as I go to the far north of Canada, as long as you can't get fortified, you know, drugs, if you happen to be in a Callowit where doesn't, you can't get anything. Whatever you brought with you, you have. So if you get an ulcer, you treat them with, with what you've got. And so I would not use tobramycin postoperably because you want to use the same Vigamox. And then if a problem occurs, it's easy to treat. Yeah, okay. It's not actually, it's not uh, strong. It is not as strong um, as, not the, as the, the moxifloxacin right. is. Yeah,